Thank you for joining us to this regular board meeting of the Santa Clara Unified School District Board of Trustees. It is Thursday, September 28th, and it is five o'clock, and I am calling this meeting to order. We will start with a roll call of attendance. Trustee Canova, absent. Trustee Gonzalez, absent. Trustee Lieberman, here. Trustee Muirhead, here. Trustee Raderman, here. Trustee Ryan, absent. And I am here. So we have four present. Trustee Valdez, here. And we also have our student trustee here. We will now have our introduction of our interpreter. Good evening, board. My name is Angelica Benitez. Mi, mi compañera uh, Veronica Adams y yo vamos a ser las intérpretes en español de esta noche. Bienvenidos a la. Could we have her restate so that everyone may hear? Veronica, can you please um, announce the translation again, please? Can you hear me now? I'm here. Yes, we can hear you. Okay, sorry about that. <clears throat> eh, buenas tardes, mi nombre es Angélica Benítez, mi compañera Verónica Adams y yo vamos a ser las intérpretes en español de esta noche. Bienvenidos a la sesión de la mesa directiva. Esta sesión está siendo transmitida en español por el canal de Zoom. Si desean escuchar esta sesión en español, por favor, hagan clic en el menú que dice interpretación y seleccionen español. En este menú también van a poder seleccionar la opción de silenciar el audio en inglés. Thank you. Thank you so much. We will now be led in the Pledge of Allegiance by our CSEA Secretary, Mrs. Schmitz. Please may we rise for the pledge. Ready, salute. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible with liberty and justice for all. Thank you, please sit. Thank you so much. Our executive director of schools, Mrs. Alyssa Meltzer will now read our district and mission, mission and vision statements. Thank you. The mission of Santa Clara Unified School District is to provide equitable, engaging and innovative educational experiences so that each student thrives in a global society. Our vision states, graduates of Santa Clara Unified School District are resilient, future ready, lifelong learners who think critically, solve problems collaboratively, and are prepared to thrive in a global society. Thank you. We will now review and accept our agenda. Prior to any motion, we need to pull L1 that will be brought back on a future agenda. Do we have a motion, motion to, approve? to approve the agenda minus item L1, second. Rotterman? We have a motion and a second. Any questions? All in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Student trustee? Aye. That passes five to uh, zero with two trustees being absent and Student Trustee Valdez also voting yes. I will now read our guidelines for public comment at a board meeting. The Board of Trustees has a policy on civility. Policy 1310.1 on civility states, this policy promotes mutual respect, civility, and orderly conduct among district employees, parents, and the public. This policy is not intended to deprive any person of his or her right to freedom of expression, but only to maintain to the extent possible and reasonable, a safe harassment free workplace for our students and staff. In the interest of presenting district employees as positive role models to the children of this district, as well as the community, SUSC encourages positive communication and discourages volatile, hostile, or aggressive actions. This district seeks the public's cooperation with this endeavor. 
I currently do not have any slips for public comment on closed session agenda items. I do not see any hands in the Zoom. So the board will now recess to closed session. In closed session, we will do the we will have the following items. Item B1, public employee discipline dismissal release. Item B2, consideration to a, hear appeal of findings of an investigation into a complaint against employees per SCUSD board policy. Item B3, conference with labor negotiators, agency representatives, Gary Waddell, <laughs> Jose Gonzalez, and Mark Scheel, employee organizations, UTSC, CSEA, AFT, and unre unrepresented employees and management. Item B4, public employee import performance evaluation, agency designated representative, board president, Vicki Fairchild, title superintendent. We anticipate being in closed session for about 75 minutes. Due to some pretty lengthy presentations, we will have a hard stop and resume closed session if necessary. So we anticipate resuming closed session regardless of our state of uh, open session, regardless of what we've gotten through closed session, just giving everyone a heads up at, at 6.30. Thank you.
Thank you for joining us. The board has returned from closed session. We will start with the introduction of our interpreter. Good evening, board. Buenas noches. Mi nombre es Verónica Adams. Angélica Benítez y yo seremos las intérpretes en español de esta noche. Bienvenidos a la reunión de la mesa directiva. Esta reunión está siendo transmitida por el canal en español de Zoom. Para escuchar esta sesión en español, oprime el botón que dice Interpretación en la parte inferior de su pantalla y seleccione el idioma de español. En este menú también puede seleccionar la opción de silenciar el audio original en inglés. Thank you. Thank you so much. I will now give our report from closed session. For item B1, the board received information. For item B2, the board received information and with a motion um, by Trustee Lieberman and a second by Trustee Muirhead voted seven to zero with all board members present to deny the uh, consideration of the hearing of the appeal. Um, for item B3, the board received information. For item B4, the board received information and gave direction. Our next item is D1, the report from the superintendent. Thank you, President Fairchild. <clears throat> Uh, the next two weeks uh, and in the past weeks have been exciting ones for our labor management partnership. Our DLT met for the first time this year, earlier this week, joined by President Fairchild. Our uh, labor management partnership steering committee has been planning uh, the first DLT meeting and uh, will be hosting the first of four site leadership team trainings this year. Uh, this work represents our continued partnership. Um, we know that a key ingredient to this work is nurturing and supporting strong site leadership teams where staff at all levels are working together collaboratively on a common goal, using data to inform their work and sharing a continuous improvement mindset. The DLT supports this work with members representing staff from all levels of our district, classrooms, school administration, district administration, labor leaders, classified, certificated, and management employees. And we're grateful for all of those uh, voices to be in the room. I would like to extend my appreciation to the teachers who served on our literacy work group. This team represents highly skilled and experienced teachers who are doing the work of literacy each and every day, bringing divergent viewpoints in terms of sites, grade spans, as well as perspectives, backgrounds, and training and approaches to elementary literacy. And we look forward to the work of this team and the recommendations that they will develop as their work proceeds. Since the last we met, I've had the great good fortune to visit a number of school sites. I'll just highlight a couple. Uh, I visited Don Calajan uh, earlier this week and was just very impressed with the positivity, focus on student learning and team feeling at the site. I was also recently at Agnew where there was a palpable positive energy around the school and engaged and focused student learning underway with some awesome young readers sharing their favorite books, which was a delight. Our human resources, special education, transportation, and family child education teams participated in the classified job fair at the County Office of Education last Saturday and had a very successful event. We have had a uh, have a number of classified positions. Our district was a popular one at the event, and we continue to be proud to be a premier employer in the county. We encourage community members who have interest in, in, in to contact human resources and learn more about open paraeducator and other classified positions. We're looking forward next week to the Santa Clara Schools Foundation Farm to Table Dinner on Friday, October 6th, supporting environmental literacy education in the districts and tickets are still available. And then the next day, Saturday, October 7th, we we're looking forward to the Parade of Champions where our district will be represented well. We invite our community out to join in the festivities. There's lots of exciting events coming up in October as we celebrate our students and staff. 
Before your next meeting on October 8th, we'll begin celebrating the week of the school administrator. I want to give a huge shout out to the principals and other administrators across the district who do the very difficult work of leading schools in ways that nurture dynamic, engaged learning environments, build strong partnerships with our labor partners, create opportunity, and create opportunity for the boys and girls of Santa Clara Unified. They truly make a difference in a host of ways, and I'm grateful for the caliber of administrators that we have. And that concludes my comments. Thank you so much. We will now have our student Senate report from Ren Brown from Santa Clara High School. There you go, sorry. Um, hello, my name is Ren Brown and I'll be doing the report about Santa Clara High School today. Um, a quick introduction before I get started. Um, again, my name is Ren Brown. My pronouns are she, her. Um, I am the Santa Clara High School's ASB board representative, and I am the LGBTQ club president at Santa Clara High School. Also, all of the images you see in my presentation are student-taken pictures, and they are all posted on student-run Instagrams. Okay, <laughs> sorry about that. Um, for the table of contents today, we're gonna go over events that happen in August at school, events that happen in September, future events happening at Santa Clara High School and sports that are happening at Santa Clara High School. So the first month of school, August. So the first thing that happened at Santa Clara High School was the freshman orientation. Uh, link crew leaders who are upperclassmen at the school get trained and get a group of freshmen, show them around the school, they get a little tour and they get to know everything about the school before school starts. And then we had the first day of school, but before that we had senior sunrise where the seniors go on the football field and watch the sunrise together. And here's some photos of that. Uh, next uh, was welcome week. Welcome week was our sp first spirit week of um, this year. In the spirit days of welcome week, we had Monday, which was beach day. Tuesday, that was pajama day. And at lunch, we had a water balloon toss. Um, Wednesday was sports day and we had a tug of war game at lunch. Uh, Thursday was Disney day and we had chalk heart going on in the quad and Friday was brew nudity day, which just means brew, wear your brew attire, blue and gold, things like that. These are all dress up days. So many students get involved and those are some of our English teachers dressing up for beach day. Um, and then also in welcome week, we had a welcome rally, which is our first rally of the year. It was super involved super spirited. It was engaging for both teachers and students. We had a lot of games going on in between, um, and it was a great way for students to learn about the school and, um, the second week into school. The cheer performed at our school and the band performed, and we got to learn the homecoming themes. Next, um, the second month of school, September. So the first thing that happened in September, we have new support announcements, which the leadership class goes into support the first month of your school to tell kids about what's going on for the rest of the school rest of the month uh, so kids can see what they want to get involved in uh, and then we had back to school night where parents come to the school they learn about what classes their student is taking and about their teachers and then we had leadership and kids volunteer at the art and wine festival during um, with the kids games and we have a lot of co-planning going on right now and i'll go into more homecoming stuff later also in September, we had our first club fair. So this was Club Rush. So Santa Clara High School clubs all go, go into the quad at lunch and students look around and join as many clubs as they want to join. And there's a vast majority of different kinds of clubs at Santa Clara High School. Next, we have future events. So the first future event happening is our Hispanic Heritage Month presentation where Santa Clara High School's club, Rosa Latina, uh, does a presentation in the theater to all of the students. All the students learn about their culture and they show off cool things about their culture like dances and foods and other things that they think is important for everyone to know. 
Also next, our big, big event coming up is homecoming. Homecoming week uh, it consists of spirit days who, that are also dress up days. Monday, we don't have school. Tuesday, we have dynamic duo, which means dress up with a partner. So like Phineas and Ferb. Um, Wednesday is Barbie versus Ken day. Thursday is pajama day and Friday is Bruin Union day. That Friday of homecoming, we have a rally, a parade and a game that all evolve our homecoming theme, childhood toys. The freshmen got Pokemon this year. The sophomores got Legos. Juniors got Hot Wheels and seniors got Barbie. They build floats out of these. They make a skit and they make a huge poster for all the kids. All the kids get super involved and try so hard with these. Everyone is welcome to come check out these things and see how much work the students have been putting into. And on Saturday of that week is the homecoming dance and this year's theme is Garden of the Lights. Next, we have sports. Right now is fall sports for the students at Santa Clara High School. 260 students have joined so far in fall sports, some of these being football, girls lacrosse, girls volleyball, um, and water polo. Then we have winter sports, and then we have spring sports. Last year, by the end of the year, 1,837 students joined our athletic program. So it shows how much students love the sports at Santa Clara High School, and they make new friends, and they really get into sports that they love. Thank you so much for listening to my bird presentation. I hope you liked it. Thank you so much. I had a flashback to Wilson Preschool and some sand and some water. I think I believe I'm thinking of the right person. Uh, we will now have our reports from our union presidents. Good evening, everyone. Lynn is on a well-deserved vacation, so I am going to do my best to represent her tonight. Um, I'm going to be giving reflections as a first-time delegate to our CSCA conference. I was really um, privileged to attend that this summer in Reno. It was my very first time, so getting out to Reno and um, and why did we, why is the California um, classified union meeting in Reno? It's just, it's just too expensive in California to be there. So we're, we were there at the Grand Sierra Resort where our wonderful assistant superintendent is right now. A big shout out to Kathy Knavel for her daughter competing um, in a big competition. So we're glad to have that. So there we are, CSCA chapter 350. And uh, I'm so glad the slides are being run by our own classified people, Ethan and Frank, too. So next slide, please. So um, this ballroom in the Grand Sierra Resort was filled with people. There were there was 1,200 people in the room with uh, TV cameras, and it was just so huge and well done. And they sat us in our different areas. Um, next slide, please. And if someone wanted to get up and speak, they um, had a specific um, microphones to stand into and, and we had to do this, so I'm gonna say it. So my name is Michelle Schmitz and I'm the secretary of uh, our chapter, but I would say Michelle Schmitz, area C, and then all the area Cs would go, Whoa! region 43, 43 would cheer, and then Santa Clara chapter 350, and then our table would cheer. So it was very exciting. Um, Next slide, please. So here we are. I, I didn't know as a um, as just being our regular chapter 350 member how large we are. So um, up and down the state, we have various um, regions. So we're region C right there. And um, region C is um, run by our very own um, retired chapter president, Patty Picard. Um, and I didn't even know how there, there's even an, a region specifically for retirees. CSCA has a vibrant retiree program with wisdom, um, and they gather from all over. And so because maybe when you retire, maybe you were in Region C, but now you're living up in Region A, so they all gather together. So that was really wonderful. Next slide, please. It was exciting to see the union president. Adam Weinberger. He's a young man um, with a lot of big ideas um, and a lot of um, 
people rallied behind him and people asked what what he wanted to focus most on on his term and he said training and he's bringing training to our um to our representatives and having more accessible training and i'm going to be tending um one on saturday so um bringing more people and getting people involved so it was really exciting to see him next slide please and here's just more of the energy and just just i just had no idea that were there were so many people sometimes you kind of are like as a secretary and you feel overwhelmed you're like oh, i don't know you know am i alone you know i'm never alone because i have people i have secretaries up and down the state that are going through similar issues as me so it was just so inspiring next slide the keynote speaker lynn um touched on this and but here's chris malls he founded the very very first amazon labor union out to new york um he described how um amazon wasn't responding to covid and um he he got it going and you know if you want to follow him on instagram he's he's good he had the hashtag hot labor summer quite an individual chris smalls next slide and then we had um education days as part of the conference kaiser theater came out um and here's um one of the um, facilitators for that really great scenarios about communication relevant real world scenarios um between um, maybe a supervisor and one of their employees. And it was really insightful. I loved it. So and I hope they can come out to Santa Clara one time. Next slide. And there's another first timer. There's Joel, Stephanie. He's, uh, he's our professional learning department person bringing trainings. He was very exciting to hang out with. We were just, it's just the energy around it, empowered courageous enduring and the last line and there's lynn there's lynn so it was lynn's not here she's on her well-deserved break we just appreciate her so much and she, we're not always going to have lynn so there's going to be people behind her like me coming up um different ones I've, I've got kathy jackson out here there's there's so many of us here and um you know we're, we just appreciate all her dedication so that's my report thank you, thank you. next Good evening, President Fairchild, Dr. Waddell, student trustee Valdez, and the Board of Trustees. <clears throat> UTSC would like to thank our members who participated in the beach cleanup this past weekend. It was a lovely weekend to be outside, and cleaning up our local parks and waterways was an added bonus. UTSC also appreciates the partnership we have in the district to continue the challenging work we have to do ahead of us. On Tuesday, I attended the Early Literacy Committee meeting with about 25 teachers, Kathy Knavel, President Fairchild, Trustee Lieberman. The first meeting was expertly facilitated by Lori Musso, who walked us through several activities to help build solid foundation between the members of the committee. It's this groundwork that we'll draw upon when we meet to critically review district and state data to identify areas of weaknesses, analyze curricular programs, and identify how best to support our students moving forward. We understand that this is imperative and we support all our students' growth in reading and writing. Yesterday, we also had a very successful first DLT meeting of the school year. We had committee members from last year as well as new members stepping into the work for the first time. New teachers to the district have been included, which will likely bring new and fresh ideas to the work ahead of us. The hallmark of a good meeting is when someone tells you, I wish we had more time to look at data sets, or I feel like we were just getting into the meat of the discussion when time was called. I heard both at the end of the DLT meeting. Turning our attention to our association, last week we held a very effective cluster director training wherein UTSC leadership continued training our cluster directors in supporting our UTSC site reps, building relationships with site administration to solve and resolve issues at the lowest level. It was a thorough training and the skills of our leadership team continue to grow and deepen. Before I close this evening, I'd like to remind the district that as an organization working with literally thousands of people, 
The more transparent and open our communication can be, the better. Inconsistent process and complete absence of written procedures in some departments leads to anger and frustration. Silence from administrators, whether at the site level or in district office departments, leaves our members feeling devalued and disrespected, especially in times of high pressure and stress. I wish I could relay how very important it is for our members to receive some kind of communication from administrators and directors. Even a simple email stating, we have heard your concern and we are working on this matter, goes a long way. Silence does not send that message. Tonight, I'll leave you with a quote from Mother Teresa. I can do things you cannot. You can do things I cannot. Together, we can do great things. While affirming each other's strengths, let's move from I to we. Have a good evening. Thank you. We will now have our public health update. Is there a public health update? <laughs> Thank you. We will now have public comment on unagendized items. This is a time for the public to comment on something that is currently not on the agenda. Uh, prior to, we, I currently have one slip, but I will read our um, policy prior to calling that individual and any other individuals who we wish to speak at that time. The Board of Trustees has a policy on civility, policy 1310.1 on civility states, this policy promotes mutual respect, civility, and orderly conduct among district employees, parents, and the public. This policy is not intended to deprive any person of his or her right to freedom of expression, but only to maintain to the extent possible and reasonable, a safe harassment-free workplace for our students and staff. In the interest of presenting district employees as positive role models to the children of this district, as well as the community, SUSD encourages positive communication and discourages volatile, hostile, or aggressive actions. This district seeks the public's cooperation with this endeavor. The public should note that while we value and want to receive public feedback, board members are prohibited by state law from commenting on, discussing, or taking action on items that are not on a meeting's agenda. The board may refer the commenter or to a staff or other resources for factual information, ask staff to report back at, to the board at a subsequent meeting concerning any matter, or take action directing staff to place a matter of business on a future agenda. When you come to the podium, please turn on the microphone. The green light indicates the microphone is on. You will have two minutes to speak. At the end of two minutes, please return to your seat. If you have additional comments, you may email the board. I currently have one um, slip to speak, um, and that's Vicki Pardini. Good evening. I'm Vicki Pardini, ELA TOSA and instructional coach at Don Calajon. What I'm going to share tonight is hard because I care about the person that I'm going to be addressing. I'm here tonight to make the board aware that some of our district employees are being are being mistreated by our board president. There have been many staff members that have shared their personal experiences with her unprofessional behavior in meetings and district committees. I myself have witnessed demands that are not reasonable. It hurts me to call out this behavior because I never thought I would have to address something like this with our current board. It feels we are moving back to a time where Ina Bendis was our, on our board and many teachers and district admin were regularly harassed and treated unprofessionally by her. Vicki, I'm truly grateful you deeply care about our students who are struggling and, and that you want them to be successful. And you're bringing urgency to a very important problem. But just like I said to our former superintendent, Dr. Kemp, you can push hard and still be respectful, treat people kindly and without harassment. You don't need to be unkind or harass people to get what you want, which ultimately causes more problems. It seems that a more appropriate role for a board member is to work together with our staff in a positive way and to be part of a solution. I am concerned that Vicki's behavior is instigating undue stress and panic that is leading to rash decisions instead of following appropriate processes with well-developed plans. 
There is nothing that can be put in place fast enough to have a dramatic impact on our scores this year. It will take years of professional development, resources, and intense intervention to have a dramatic impact. This requires an extensive professional development plan. Vicki's behavior is pushing for problems to be solved immediately, which prevents equity of voice and causes top-down decisions, which goes against our labor management partnership. I urge the board president to step back and take a different approach. I urge Thank the rest you for of the your time to pay attention and hold each other accountable for their actions. Thank you for your time. Would you like to speak? Sure. You can come up. He will have two minutes. Good evening. My name is Dee Umo, and I'm the parent of two children enrolled in the district. At the last board meeting, there was a comment made by um, a gentleman, an English teacher, Mr. Jackson. Okay. Um, um, and I'm familiar with Mr. Jackson. He and I were both involved in the social justice and equity uh, committee last year. Mr. Jackson made a comment that I wanted to reply to in private since I knew him personally. And I wanted our conversation to remain private because I'm a private person. I don't like discussing controversial issues publicly, but I, but I decided as a parent, there are many topics that are being foisted onto our children with little to no parent participation, input or perspective. The topic of book banning being one of them. Let me be clear, parents don't want to ban books. Parents want to ban pornography. We don't want our children to have access, access to books that involve rape, molestation, prostitution, sexual abuse, oral sex, fisting, sex toys, masturbation, pedophilia, bestiality, anal sex, among other things. If anyone <clears throat> were to walk up to you at your job and start raising these topics, they would be called a pervert and disciplined accordingly for sexual harassment or sexual assault. If someone were to speak to your own child in this manner, they would be called a pedophile or a groomer. Why do we think it's okay for children to have access to this, to this material, especially without a per parent's knowledge or consent? I personally champion free speech in all aspects, but we need to exercise wisdom, discernment, and plain common sense. The Supreme Court in the case of the Board of Education versus PICO in 1982 ruled five to four to allow the removal of books that were, that were quote, quote unquote, perversive, perver pervasively vulgar and to take into account community standards when deciding if books are pornog pornographic or obscene. Let's please, let's not normalize giving sexually explicit material to children. Thank you. Thank you. Are there any other members of the public who wish to speak? All right, we will now have our public hearing to receive input regarding the assurance of compliance sufficiency of pupil textbooks and instructional materials. Can I have a motion, motion to open the public hearing? I have a motion. And a second, all in, oh, we have to do a roll call vote. Is Trustee Gonzalez still online? Yes. Yes, okay. The video has been stopped, so I don't know why, but anyways, yeah, I'm still here. Okay, so we'll do a roll call vote to open the public hearing. Trustee Canova? Yes. Trustee Gonzalez? Yes. Trustee Lieberman? Yes. Trustee Muirhead? Yes. Trustee Ratterman? Yes. Trustee Ryan? Yes. And I vote yes. That passes seven to zero. Student trustee votes? Yes. Also votes yes. Do we, I have no slips. Do we have any comments about this item? Motion to close public hearing. Ratterman? We, we have a motion and a second. Um, trustee Canova? Trustee Gonzalez? Yes. Trustee Lieberman? Yes. Trustee Muirhead? Yes. Trustee Ratterman? Yes. Trustee Ryan? Yes. I vote yes. That passes seven to zero. Student Trustee Valdez? Yes. That passed with Student Trustee Valdez also voting yes. We will now have our consent items. Consent items from Human Resources. Do I have a motion to approve? Motion to approve, Rodderman. Second, Lieberman. We have a motion and a second. Trustee Canova? Yes. Trustee Gonzalez? Yes. Trustee Lieberman? Yes. Trustee Muirhead? Yes. Trustee Raderman? Yes. Trustee Ryan? Yes. And I vote yes. That passes seven to zero. Now we have our other consent items. Motion to approve, Raderman. Second, Lieberman. We have a motion and a second. Trustee Canova? Yes. Trustee Gonzalez? Yes. Trustee Lieberman? Yes. Trustee Muirhead? Yes. 
Trustee Ratterman? Yes. Trustee Ryan? Yes. And I vote yes. Student Trustee Valdez? Yes. That passes seven to zero with Student Trustee Valdez also voting yes. Our next item is our J1, the second reading of the board policy and board bylaws. Do we have a motion to approve? Motion to approve, Rotterman. Second, Lieberman. We have a motion and a second. I have no slips. There's no, any comments? Okay. Trustee Canova? Yeah. Trustee Gonzalez? Yes. Trustee Lieberman? Yes. Trustee Muirhead? Yes. Trustee Ratterman? Yes. Trustee Ryan? Yes. And I vote yes. Student Trustee Valdez? Yes. So that passes seven to zero with Student Trustee Valdez also voting yes. Our next item is action item K1, resolution 2355, affirming October 18th through 14th as week of the school administrator. To approve We have a motion to approve from Trustee Muirhead and a second. Second. From Trustee Lieberman. Okay, Trustee Canova. Yes. Trustee Gonzalez. Yes. Trustee Lieberman. Yes. Trustee Muirhead. Yes. Trustee Ratterman. Yes. Trustee Ryan. Yes. And I vote yes, student Trustee Valdez. Yes. That passes seven to zero with student trustee Valdez also voting yes. We have action item K2, resolution 2354, affirming October 23rd to 31st as Red Ribbon Week. Move to approve Lieberman. Second. Here. We have a motion and a second. Trustee Canova? Yes. Trustee Gonzalez? Yes. Trustee Lieberman? Yes. Trustee Muirhead? Yes. Trustee Ratterman? Yes. Trustee Ryan? Yes. I vote yes. Student trustee Valdez? Yes. That passes seven to zero, but student trustee Valdez also voting yes. We have action item K3, resolution 2353, affirming October as National Bullying Prevention Month. Move, move. Second, Muirhead. Okay, we have a motion and a second. Trustee Canova? Yes. Trustee Gonzalez? Yes. Trustee Lieberman? Yes. Trustee Muirhead? Yes. Trustee Ratterman? Yes. Trustee Ryan? Yes. I vote yes, student trustee Valdez? Yes. That passes seven to zero with student trustee Valdez also voting yes. We have action item K4, resolution 2352, affirming October is LGBTQ plus history month. Move approve, Ryan. Second. We have a motion and a second. Trustee Canova. Yes. Trustee Gonzalez. Yes. Trustee Lieberman. Yes. Trustee Muirhead. Yes. Trustee Ratterman. Yes. Trustee Ryan? Yes. I vote yes. Student Trustee Valdez? Yes. That passes seven to zero with Student Trustee Valdez also voting yes. Our next action item is M.1 because we pulled L.1, and that's the fee waiver request from Santa Visits Alviso Foundation. Motion to approve. Rodderman. Second. Lieberman. We have a motion and a second. Trustee Canova? Yes. Trustee Gonzalez? Yes. Trustee Lieberman? Yes. Trustee Muirhead? Yes. Trustee Ratterman? Yes. Trustee Ryan? Yes. I vote yes, student trustee Valdez. Yes. That passes seven to zero with student trustee Valdez also voting yes. Our next action item is in dot one, resolution 2356, adoption of sufficiency of instructional materials. Motion to approve, Rodderman. Second. Who was the first? R Rodderman. Oh, second. Mm -hmm. Second from trustee Muirhead. Um, trustee Canova. Yes. Trustee Gonzalez. Yes. Trustee Lieberman? Yes. Trustee Muirhead? Yes. Trustee Ratterman? Yes. Trustee Ryan? Yes. I vote yes, student trustee Valdez? Yes. That passes seven to zero with student trustee Valdez also voting yes. So now we come to our information item. Our first information item is 0.1, Mathematics Achievement, Continuous Improvement Strategies for the 2023-2024 school year. Before we start this, uh, um, Mr. Sam and I have had some really good conversations, and I want to thank um, the team before their work. He and I talked about this was a big lift. We really appreciated it um, because there is a sense of urgency on the board, and um, we share that sense of urgency. And so I really appreciate um, the work that went into this, especially considering um, the transparency in these slides. So we will start with the presentation. Um, then as we've done before, the board will have comments and then we will go out to the public for any comments they may have. Thank you, President Fairchild. We're pleased to bring strategies to support our district-wide mathematic 
work this evening. As we've been doing preliminary analysis of our data, we have identified needs in mathematics and in English language arts. While we're working with teams on long-term strategies, we also wanted to begin to put systems in place to support our students this year. Chief Academic and Innovation Officer Stam has worked with a number of teams to develop the recommendations that you will hear this evening, and we will share some preliminary data with you as well. Thank you, Dr. Waddell, and good evening, President Fairchild, trustees, student trustee Valdez, and Ms. Burrell. It's my pleasure to present the strategies currently in place or planned this year to improve math achievement. We share the board and the superintendent's sense of urgency to improve student math achievement, and the preparation of this presentation has been a catalyst for planning and action that will benefit our teachers and our students this year, as well as in future years. Before I start, I'd like to thank the classroom teachers, the TOSAs, department chairs, site and district administrators who provided input into the content of this presentation in the past three weeks. Uh, I would like to recognize in particular our math TOSAs, Rachel Feinstein, Deanna Watts, Julie Vasquez, um, as well as um, Vicki and Ashley, uh, and also our Director of Professional Learning, Karen Allard, and Director of Secondary Education, Matt Baldwin. I'd also, also like to recognize Trisha Ringel and Kathy Knabel could not be here this evening for their role as well. I'd like to share, uh, before I get started, how I've structured this presentation. I'm gonna start with some data that illustrates the challenges we have before us as a district in math achievement. It's not a comprehensive data set, but it focuses on contrasting our annual state test data in math with that of the county and the state, and then also highlighting the gap between our overall math test data and that of our largest student group, our Hispanic Latino students. And I also apologize in advance if my voice starts to fail me. I have water here, so please bear with me. After the data, I will share our three-year math goals, a definition of mathematical rigor, and the components of a systemic approach to improving math achievement. I'll then go more in depth with our K-5 strategies than our 6-12 strategies before sharing some K-12 strategies and a high-level overview of our plans for the 2024 through 2026 school years and beyond. We're in the process of designing a multi-year plan, but the focus tonight is what we are doing this year to improve outcomes. Our North Star, our why for our district is our vision statement, and the board says it at every meeting, uh, what we aim to prepare all of our graduates to know and be able to do for a successful adulthood. Mathematics can play a key role in developing students' capacity to think critically and to solve problems to the key competencies in our graduate portrait. Our commitment to improve the achievement of all students and close opportunity gaps for our historically underserved students is a central focus for our work. The challenge before us is no more starkly represented than our, in our mathematics achievement data, which I will show you now. So I'm gonna spend a minute on this slide um, because it's similar to a series of data slides. Um, so once I orient, orient you to the first couple slides, I'll go faster through the remaining slides. This graph provides a historical look at our achievement data on the annual state math test, the California Assessment of Student Performance and Progress, or CASP. The circles represent the percentage of students overall in dark orange and the percentage of our Hispanic Latino students in light orange, meeting or exceeding grade level standards in grades three through eight and in grade 11, which are the grades students are tested by the state in math as well as English language arts. As you can see, both the overall and the Latino student group show a gradual increase of about two percentage points a year on average from 2014-15 to 2018-19 before falling back down several percentage points after the COVID pandemic testing gap of two years. This decline is also evident in the county and the state data. This county and state data are still embargoed for this year. However, we are allowed to share our 22-23 state data. Um, our overall rate of 48% meeting or exceeding standards was 15 points higher than the state's overall rate last year and three points below the county overall, which was at, at 51%. We can see very clearly the yawning gap with our Hispanic Latino student group. It is extremely troubling, 48% versus 20%, a 28 percentage point gap. Only one in five of our Latino students is at or above grade level standards in math. In each of the subsequent data slides, I will show overall data and data for our Latino student group and reveal how pervasive and persistent this gap 
is for 40% of our student population in Santa Clara Unified. One caveat that I would be in trouble with our data and assessment department if I did not mention is that this data is not complete, but it represents about 96% of our data. The final 4% that is still being tallied by the state um, before the final official numbers are released is trending lower, not higher. We're allowed to share this data with the acknowledgement that it is preliminary. On this graph, you can see that in 2122, our district, again, will always be in orange, did slightly worse than the county overall in teal on Hispanic Latino caste math achievement, 19% versus 20%. And we see very little, little improvement, if any, this year. The most recent batch of data, as I said, is trending lower, and we don't know the county results yet, but we are essentially back to where we were in 2014-15. Again, this is overall all of the grade levels tested. On this slide, you can see the addition of state data in brown to our data in orange and the county data in teal. Those colors will always be the same in all the slides. The states, oh, I jumped too, thank you. The state's meet or exceed standards data for Hispanic Latino students in math is at 21%. So it's actually slightly higher than the county at 20 and our district at 19. Here are the overall data for grades three through five students on the CASP. We are the orange. Again, we're the orange, the state is in brown, and the county is in teal. These colors are the same for each graph. This data shows that we are three points above the county, 57 versus 54%, and considerably higher than the state overall at 38%. It's the light touch that works. Here's the same data filtered for a Latino student group. They are slightly outperforming the state and county. 27% to 25 and 24% respectively. The headline here though, is that a little more than one out of four of our Latino students in grades three through five in our district is meeting or exceeding grade level standards on the CASP map. This graph shows overall student performance on the CASP map for middle school students. At 50%, the county is doing significantly better than either the district at 41 or 42% or the state at 31%. Both the county and the district have shown a five percentage point decline from pre-COVID data. This graph shows that our Latino middle schoolers are meeting or exceeding standards on the CAS map at a lower rate than either the state at 19% or the county at 19%. We are four percentage points below at 15%. Moving now to high school. Our 11th grade students are the only ones in high school to take the CAS math assessment. For 11th graders overall, last 21-22, our scores were nine percentage points below the county at 38% versus 47%. We are projecting some improvement over last year, which is positive. Repeating a pattern that we saw in middle school, our Latino student group data has been below the state and county percentages, 12% versus 15%. We are seeing some improvement for this past year of 4% percentage points, which is positive. In sum, our state math assessment data shows a sobering picture in which overall performance that in some instances lags the county and the state and a huge gap between our overall data and our Hispanic Latino student group data. We have set very ambitious goals for improving math achievement on the CASP over the next three years. Our goal for overall achievement is a 17 point increase and our goal for Latino student group achievement is a 30 point increase. These goals require that we adopt a comprehensive set of improvement strategies and not just tinker at the edges. When we say math achievement, it's important to be clear about what that involves. We have a new state framework in math re recently adopted. This framework doubles down, doubles down on the definition of mathematical rigor originally stated in the 2013 framework. 
The three components of rigor are, one, procedural fluency, which is the what of mathematics. A student who is procedurally fluent has flexibility in solution paths, is accurate in their solutions, and sees connections among solution paths. Two, conceptual understanding, which is the why of mathematics. A student who has conceptual understanding can articulately explain their reasoning and uses logic to approach new and unfamiliar concepts. And three, application, which is the when and the how of mathematics. Application in mathematics means using mathematics procedures and reasoning to solve real world problems and create models to describe different situations. Why is that important? CAST assesses the definition of rigor that I just described. Only a third of a student's score on CAST is based upon their ability to use algorithms to solve an equation in the traditional sense. In order to be proficient on CAST, students need to also demonstrate their ability to problem solve, model with data, and communicate their reasoning. We have to make sure that our curriculum, instruction, assessment, and professional learning for teachers are all aligned so that we can help students develop these three core mathematical competencies in a balanced and complementary way. I am not here tonight to assign blame or point fingers. There are a lot of reasons for how we got to where we are today. Our teachers, administrators, parents, and students are all doing their best with our current circumstances and resources. We have many examples of extraordinary teaching and learning taking place all over this district. The truth is, we have let our district support system for math atrophy and in some areas completely fall apart. We need a robust and systemic approach to substantially improve student achievement in mathematics, especially for our historically underserved students. You can see on this slide the elements of that approach. This approach will take some time to implement, but there are concrete actions we're implementing this year, which I will go into more detail about in the next slides. I will first focus on the actions we will take at the elementary level and then shift to the secondary level. Actions that you see on each slide that are in black were those already planned and currently in implementation. Actions that you see in blue are enhancements currently under development for implementation this year. The Orogo curriculum has been criticized over the years. The truth is there is no perfect curriculum and Orogo has seen significant enhancements in the past couple of years. Until the next math adoption, three or more years away, we will focus on optimizing its use, make sure that all teachers have a strong familiarity with its new features and effective use, and supplement it with high quality resources. There have been updates to the digital components over the past two years, and we have provided tutorial pages for teachers, RSPs, pairs, and TOSAs with videos on how to use the new updated access platform of Origo. We're revising the math framework and pacing guide and including components of the math instructional block and providing support resources around math, uh, math talks, number sense routines, learning stations, centers, games, and math menus, and building math vocabulary. We have not onboarded teachers well to our adopted curriculum. We will be doing that this year in an intentional and systematic way and from now going forward. There's also misalignment um, between the curriculum with CASP and math. Much of the CASP content is covered in the later mo modules of Origo, too late to prepare students for testing. So we are addressing that issue. And there's little in the current curriculum that prepares students for the performance task component of the CASP. Mars tasks do this, and they are essentially what the performance task in CASP has been modeled after. So on to assessment. At this time, iReady is the only data point collected district-wide for elementary math. Orgo has pre and post tests for each module for teachers to use, but that data is not collected. Teachers have access to the universal screeners for number sense. They're used to diagnose student knowledge and needs in number sense and to plan instructional support. Some teachers have been trained and they are being supported and managed by the elementary math TOSAs. However, this has not been systematically done yet. We are uh, initiating data literacy modules this year, and these modules build upon one another. The first module, which has already been implemented, is called Getting to Know Your Students. It leverages information about a teacher's current roster at the beginning of the school year related to the demographics, the program, and the edu educational outcomes from the prior year. 
The next module, Setting the Tone with iReady, looks at student results from the first math diagnostic and helps teachers assess learning loss from the prior year to inform instructional choices. And we will be supporting standards alignment efforts as well as helping teachers have a better idea of the modules in Orgo that are assessed in iReady and CASP. This is a critical and will be an ongoing effort of alignment. It's not something that happens overnight. I wanted to share this graphic around creating an aligned assessment system. This is a high level simplified design of our assessment system with three main categories, formative, interim, and summative. As you can see here, they all play an important role and have distinct purposes. The list of assessments is incomplete. Um, some examples are recommended, but not in use district-wide. For example, the MARS tasks, um, exit tickets are not used district-wide. You see iReady here as well. I wanna mention something about iReady. There are four components to the iReady platform. Diagnostic assessments, which are in use district-wide three times a year. The MyPath individualized student lessons based upon their assessment results. So provide students with lessons um, in areas where they need. Teacher-led lessons and supplemental materials. These are being used very inconsistently across the district. And standards mastery assessments, which are smaller assessments tied to specific standards that teachers can use to assess whether students have actually reached or exceeded proficiency. We'll be convening a series of focus groups with teachers and administrators about iReady to learn more from their experiences, positive and negative, in order to generate specific and clear guidance about the appropriate use of each of the components in math, not only to support teachers um, new to grades K through eight in the district, but also all teachers. And so students and families have a clear understanding of appropriate and effective use. This, this work will begin next month. Ed Services and Professional Learning have collaborated to create a comprehensive math plan to engage or re-engage teachers in the Orego curriculum that includes onboarding new K-5 teachers this year, as well as providing a training for all K-5 teachers on the new Orego curriculum updates. The Orego curriculum update training will take place in November and Orego consultants, as well as our elementary math TOSAs will facilitate this training to ensure all K-5 teachers have received this information district-wide. In addition, we will increase teachers' knowledge regarding the CAS Math Summative Assessment Blueprint for grades three through five teachers. These are the grade levels in elementary where students take the CAS. We can see from the supplemental supports uh, slide that um, our supplemental supports in mathematics in the district are incomplete. Um, we do have students, students have completed 38,711 MyPath math lessons in the first two months of school. 95% of those lessons were passed. We started the u um, uh, summer learning uh, at four sites this past summer. Uh, u is the Joe Bowler curriculum out of Stanford that we have actually built into a more robust teacher usable curriculum. We'd like to expand these offerings this coming summer and provide additional staff so that teachers can focus on, on math instead of teaching both math and literacy and provide professional development for our teachers while they were teaching one day a week. Um, this is still, on, the design of this is still under development. There is a need for more supplemental support in math. A few schools have used site funds to hire math intervention teachers to support math, but this is not a common practice, unlike in literacy. And as you can see in the blue, we're working on a design for additional support and intervention for students after school. People are familiar with the SOAR program. We're working to create a 2.0 version that is more flexible, more equitable in terms of who gets, which students get prioritized for services and allows for sharing of students by teachers across a grade level or within a school. We know that there are challenges with transportation. We'll be working to address these as well. This is a priority to, for design and development beginning next month. Now we'll move to secondary. So starting uh, at the top, MARS tasks are multi-step word programs. There are one to three per unit. One class sessions for uh, instruction or 15 minutes when used for assessment. We are collecting no usage data about the MARS task. 
but they are designed as low floor, high ceiling tasks that can be solved in multiple ways. The tasks focus on application and conceptual understanding and should be implemented in a variety of ways in classrooms, including as formative assessments, classroom activities, and or summative assessments. If you recall, I stated earlier that the performance task element of CAS map was designed after Mars task. So the greater familiarity that students have with these tasks, the greater the familiarity they're going to have with the performance task element of CAS. Math language routines were developed by a research team at Stanford. There are eight categories of routines that each bring student voice to the center of classrooms. Each routine has embedded supports for emergent multilingual students and leverage student voice to build deeper understanding. An example, critique, correct, clarify. You take an incorrectly solved problem, you have students discover the issue and discuss potential strategies to correct the issue and then offer their corrections. Uh, Prism VR is a new instructional innovation using virtual reality. All the Algebra One teachers at Wilcox and Santa Clara High will be implementing Prism this year. Lastly, Desmos and OpenUp both use the illustrative mathematics as the backbone of their curriculums. IM equally emphasizes all three components of mathematical rigor, and Desmos and OpenUp have perfect scores on ed reports um, for standard alignment and rigor. Uh, because of this, we predict that student math achievement will improve. Teachers will work in their professional learning cohorts to determine how to best use these resources to supplement the district adopted curriculum. And every math six and all but two high school geometry teachers have committed to using this curriculum. I know that the district had a history of the use of common interim and or end of, end of unit or end of course assessments. Due to reasons that I don't fully understand, but exacerbated by the pandemic, these practices have fallen away. Right now, iReady is the only common comparable assessment that we have in the middle grades for math. But the good news is that the development of common assessments is a focus of the data and assessment committee beginning this year. and will be part of a multi-year effort to develop and or adopt common assessments, not only in math, but across the grade levels and subject areas in the district, beginning where we have nothing. We're introducing data literacy modules, as I said earlier, also in secondary to assist teachers in their PLCs and department meetings to provide data in an accessible format to teachers with tools and protocols to use that data to inform instructional decision making. And the, the data and assessment department will be creating or adapting existing video resources for teachers on the CASP test structure and vocabulary. This will help them experiment with the interim assessment materials that are available to teachers. At high school, they could use the CASP interim assessments as an alternative to become more familiar with the question types and the tools available to students as they solve the questions. We recognize that in middle school, teachers are using iReady as an interim assessment. Um, we're encouraging teachers to use the Focus Interim Assessment Block, or FAIB, as a formative assessment tool and to fam familiarize students with them. And that's, those are um, from the CASP, released from the CASP. The cohorts of Math 6 and Geometry teachers started two weeks ago and will continue to meet monthly until March. Every Math 6 teacher and all but two Geometry teachers, as I said before, are participating. The Tech Innovation cohorts include support with utilizing technology to make math classes as well as other subjects more engaging for students to support learning. We will be providing the information on the CAS test blueprint and vocabulary prompt structure. Um, we will train the math department chairs who will then spend time in their meetings uh, reviewing the CAS blueprints and tools with teachers. Um, if the pathways are approved, we will have a lot of geometry teachers next year, so the onboarding will be critical. There are currently more options for supplemental supports in mathematics in secondary. Students could use paper.co for math. However, most are not. We believe that many are shifted to chat GPT. That uh, requires more investigation. The UCube summer program was offered for the first time this past summer, and we had 58 6th through 8th graders participate. The curriculum was developed by the team at Stanford, and as I said before, emphasizes the low floor, high ceiling tasks. Um, it's both remediation of previous content and previewing the upcoming school year's content, focusing on the essential understandings necessary to each grade level. We plan to expand this program in summer 2024. And also, um, tutorial is an opportunity 
um, for supplemental supports in math, although there's a high degree of variation in the use of tutorial. So some grades K through 12 slides quickly. So collaboration and leadership. All schools are developing measurable math goals and are getting support in doing so. The principals are leading this effort. The data literacy modules I mentioned are supporting grade level and departmental PLCs and their cycles of inquiry. And we're currently researching best practice nationally around teacher leader networks within districts. This is another support structure that the district used to have and does no longer in the elementary grades. We'll be developing this in coordination for the need for, um, we will be developing this in coordination with the efforts to create teacher leaders in literacy. We, that needs to be a coordinated effort because at some of our smaller elementary schools, um, we may be going after the same teachers. Um, it's a key capacity building and leadership development strategy that is very aligned with our labor management partnership goals as well. And we anticipate working closely with our partners in UTSC. Elementary principals are also getting trained on look fors from Orego. Secondary principal network meetings involve classroom walkthroughs and observations. They'll be trained on an observation guide from the true math framework, which is part of the new California math framework. Why mindset? Well, there are long standing concerns um, that uh, bias, um, stereotype, uh, lack of growth mindset uh, frequently um, uh, manifests in our BIPOC, with our BIPOC students and also with young women and girls, um, pervasive historical stereotypes that they cannot or are not good at math. Um, the good news is that the new math framework directly addresses these issues and provides guidance for the district on strategies for equitable and engaging instruction in math. We're also, also looking at other professional learning opportunities aligned with our equity framework and other anti-racist, anti-bias professional learning opportunities. Our equitable grading cohorts are continuing. For example, the Wilcox algebra teachers are developing common grading practices that draw from equitable grading principles and are also working on common assessments. And this is work that they are doing during the district professional days of learning. And finally, structures, resources, and policies. I wanna acknowledge that the math pathways proposal current, currently underway is a critical component of this systemic improvement plan. As we further develop the plan, we will have a clear assessment of the investments needed. There are data points that we did not include in this presentation also that relate to our Hispanic Latino um, students graduate uh, graduation eligibility for UC CSU admission which are quite low and also disproportionate Ds and Fs for a Hispanic Latino student group as well. So there are potential um, policy implications around our graduation requirements that we will be looking into and look forward to engaging um, with the board around in the future. So what about not just this year, but the next couple of years? Um, we're beginning, as I said, the development of a multi-year math achievement improvement plan, and it will include an assessment of the financial investments needed. You can see up here some of the key strategies. Um, a lot of it has to do with, with scaling up, making systemic um, common practices in curriculum, instruction, and assessment, um, and making sure that we have a robust professional development infrastructure, building upon the good work that, that is already underway but to include systematic onboarding of new teachers and opportunity for ongoing refreshment um, for our seasoned teachers. Um, and then in 612, pretty similar. One thing I do wanna point out uh, as well is this idea of cross school grade level and or course alike teacher collaboration. This was another practice historically in the district that teachers found very valuable. The opportunity to get with colleagues from other schools who share the same curriculum um, and collaborate around best practices and resource sharing, and also ideally development of common assessments. With any initiative or um, improvement effort, it's critical to evaluate our implementation and impact. The professional learning and data and assessment departments will be taking the lead on these evaluation efforts, and you can see some of the key ind indicators that we will be using 
for that. And I wanna say in conclusion that while this presentation has been put together on a tight timeline, we're using the momentum created by this process to move the work forward with urgency and greatly increase clarity. We look forward to rebuilding a robust system of support for a high and equitable student achievement in mathematics and doing it in collaboration with our partners, our teachers, our administrators, and our students. So thank you, and I'm happy to hear the board comment, board's comments and questions, and the team is here as a resource as well. Thank you so much, uh, Mr. Sam. We really appreciate the work and the transparency, and um, hopefully this will help us to move forward. We will now go to board questions. Our first um, trustee is Trustee Canova, and, um, and then I will call on all the others, I'm sure. <laughs> thank you. Uh, first, thank you for the presentation. Uh, with such short notice, really impressive. I mean, my gosh, fantastic work, really uh, greatly appreciated. Uh, one one thing that um, we've talked about in the past, but but it shouldn't be missed, is math phobia. I mean, there's there's a lot of students who are just afraid of math. Um, I was afraid of math as a kid, and uh, my father was uh, a mil ex military pilot, and he was a jet pilot, so he was very heavy on mathematics. So learning algebra with my dad was a very intense thing. And I have three sisters, and I had one sister that she just nailed it and nailed it. She'd be hiding around the corner when I was under the bright lights, sweating bullets as my dad was drilling me on algebra. So I developed quite a bit of a math phobia as a kid. Um, I got over it when um, I went into college. I took business law, and I kind of fell in love with math. When I could connect it to numbers and running a business and earning a living and, and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, just like so many things in life, it made sense. I could connect it to my everyday life. It wasn't just being drilled under the bright lights in the kitchen by my dad about algebra. But phobia is a big deal. I think people should recognize that. Um, when it comes to things like ChatGPT, I love ChatGPT so much. I'm very inquisitive and I spend so much time with it. I love it. But um, I think there's just so many resources for our kids to be successful um, more than ever before. And um, I think this is something that we need to tackle for sure. Um, I'm glad that we are. Uh, it's going to require all of us to um, to put our best selves forward to see it through. And we can do it. But to do all of this at such a short notice, I'm very impressed. And um, and I think, you know, we are, we're a culture where um, we're afraid of failure. So many in our culture are afraid of failure. And we should not teach fear of failure. We should not let anyone think that failure is a bad thing. Failure is the greatest teacher you'll ever have. And we should embrace failure. <laughs> failure is where you find success. Um, that's where you renew yourself and you get back to it and you get better. So no more fear of failure. It's our greatest asset. Thank you. We will have Trustee Ratterman and then Trustee Gonzalez on the Zoom. Oh, there. Well, just that I want to, I want to really underscore your point about math as a means to accomplishing some, something meaningful or important to you versus just math as an end in and of itself. It's probably 0.01% of the population for whom math is an end of itself is, is meaningful and they're a very important part of the population, but CTE and other strategies stem where we can make it uh, an important means I think is really critical. And you're absolutely right about the phobia and we need to, we need to spend more time thinking about how we can counter that and really invest in growth mindset um, and addressing implicit bias uh, that, that can pervade mathematics as well. Thank you, uh, Trustee Ratterman, and then we'll go out to the Zoom for Trustee Gonzalez. Thank you. I think we can all agree that our um, current achievement levels are not where we want them to be, okay? And what I do want to compliment uh, both the superintendent, yourself, and the team that we've got uh, at SESDSD for looking at that, recognizing it, starting to put resources together, coming up with an aggressive plan uh, to address the issue. Um, you know, last last meeting's report on pathways, and then this meeting's report. And I really like the the phrasing "continuous uh, achievement improvement." It, there's a quality angle to that that I that I greatly appreciate. Um, those are those show that commitment to getting it done. Um, I will tell you that 
Uh, by the way, I think the English also is an area that we, the English is, and I know we're already taking steps in that area, so I don't want to just make it only about math. Uh, but, you know, from my perspective, this is probably one of the most important areas that we need to spend time on, spend focus on. It goes to the core of why we're here. We're supposed to be educating. Math and English are the two gateway subjects. Um, and so we need to make sure that we do everything we can to let these kids excel. Um, we need to get the data. We need to make the assessments to make sure we know where they're at and whether what we're doing is working. Um, we need to have the enthusiasm uh, to get behind it and say, look, we are, we can, we will, we will do this. This is something that's going to happen. There's no doubt we're going to make these improvements. And, um, you know, and I, I think the improvements need to be significant. By significant, I mean double, triple what we've been achieving so far in proficiency. So um, I, I'm really excited about where we're going and the work that you're doing and the team, the work the team is doing. Um, because these kids, and there does need to be a sense of urgency. I think that's really important because the kids that are in the pipeline now don't get to wait until we get our, get the system down. We need to take care of the kids as fast as we can and make sure everything works well. Thank you. Thank you, Trustee Ratterman. We'll now go out to the Zoom to Trustee Gonzalez. Thank you, uh, President Fairchild. Um, and now I guess I can get my video on. But uh, as far as a uh, couple of questions I have, I know that CASP has only done th th grades three through eight and uh, grade 11. Do we also do formative testing or some, some, uh, some testing that we can get data from in those intermediate years, you know, ninth, 10th, 12th, maybe some of the lower grades? Yes, we absolutely plan to. Um, one piece of good news about iReady is that it is highly correlated with CASP in terms of outcomes. Um, so we can use it uh, in with some predictive confidence. Um, there are some criticisms about, um, you know, students who are doing well on iReady, not doing well on other assessments or vice versa, which is something that we have to look at. But really what we need, and I think the algebra teachers are, are moving in this direction, is assessments that are common across the district that allow for comparability across classrooms and across schools that are grounded in the essential standards that are going to prepare students to be successful um, on the state assessment um, or really on any standards-based assessment or performance task. So that is the work ahead of us um, to build out that assessment infrastructure, that common assessment infrastructure. Uh, there's more available in uh, English language arts than there is in math right now. Um, one point that I did want to make about um, English language arts and math, and this is something that Margie Waisaki said at uh, the district leadership team the other day. She said, well, the math assessment is also an English assessment because if the students don't understand what they're reading, they're not going to be able to solve all but the sort of basic algorithmic questions on the test. So it is, we, we have to think about it as a, a synergistic effort, not as two competing initiatives. And that's work that Kathy and I and others will be putting our heads together to do. And I would agree with that. I think uh, the more that Common Core has, has, you know, they have more word problems, more, uh, more things like that. It definitely is uh, an English issue as well. Um, I guess, so if, if we don't have some of that data and we're moving towards getting that data as far as, uh, you know the grades that were not um, that are not tested by CAST. It, it is highly important for us to look at the data. If you don't measure it, you know we're not going to be able to assess it. To the square, I think to fix things. I know uh, um, years ago there was a, a service called uh, I want to say the School City of School something, and uh, just uh, sitting down with that the the CEO, he could basically look across one of our school sites look at a different grade, tell you which grade was performing better. Maybe, you know, so you, we, we understand the data. I think uh, our, our, uh, or we should understand the data and our, our educational leaders should be able to, to say, okay, you know, what's going on in this classroom on the school site? What are we doing? Are we differentiating or what, what's going on to uh, be able to assist us in, in, uh, in moving the needle? Um, you know, it's, it's been, uh, I've been on the board for a few years and we haven't seen much improvement. And I just I'll just stand by my two minutes by saying years ago when we went through the Great Recession, there was uh, an open house, a teacher, an English teacher, one of our comprehensive high schools, 
basically, uh, I was lamenting that we're going to probably have to get rid of our LMAs in our cost, cost cutting measures or what have you. And uh, the English teacher reminded me that well, that is true if we, we might have to do that. But there was there was uh, districts across the county, especially like in East San Jose, that did not have that resource to begin with. So we have resources that other districts don't have, so that we're not even moving the uh, the needle within the county, let alone maybe the state. I think it is is troubling. I think we 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 can do better. We should be doing better. Our our students deserve the best we can do. And you know how we get there. I think this plan would help us do that. You know, but you you're the educational leaders, and uh, you you know I'm sure you'll you'll help us with the answers. Thank you. Just one point about data. Um, it's been a holy grail to have it a fully integrated, dynamic, easy to understand data system where teachers can draw up individual students and see not only their current status, but their entire career in the district. And it's something that we are working for because if we're asking teachers to use data to make very consequential instructional decisions, we wanna make sure that we have the best in class tools available for our teachers. Um, and so that that is an area of additional investigation. I do want to compliment our data and assessment department for putting together some really impressive tools uh, in a relatively short span of time. Uh, but we do we do have a ways to go um, with regards to the improvement of our data platforms. Thank you. Thank you so much, Trustee Lieberman. Um, okay, got a lot of moving parts. Um, First, thank you, Mr. Sam and your team. This was a massive lift and I, it's an incredible presentation. So thank you very much. Um, I had a couple questions. Um, when I'm looking at the data for County of Santa Clara for grades six through eight, and I compare it to you, our district, it's 50% for the County and 41% for Santa Clara. So that's on, I don't know what page is this, but um, so that I'm not, I, I like, Trustee Canova have a math phobia, thanks to my dad, um, who would correct my homework and go, there's one wrong, go find it. And I would spend the rest of the night trying to find it. Um, but that that suggests to me that there are districts in our county that are very high performing. Um, if, if the county's at 50% and we're at 41, there's something moving that balance in the county to 50%. Have we looked at those districts and what they're doing and uh, to see what their best practices are? We will. I mean, one of the things that it's important to note is that I focus tonight on our Hispanic Latino student group. We have other student groups who are highly outperforming our overall data, in particular our Asian and white student groups, particularly our Asian student groups. Um, not all, but but many within that student group. Um, and so I think one of the tasks ahead when the county does release its data and we can look across districts is to see where are they which which districts are moving the needle with our historically underserved student populations um, and and which schools and which grade levels and which teachers in our own district as well are moving the deep where are the positive outliers um, that's really going to be the task we need to learn from them what are they doing right by these students great yeah that's that's what I was curious about. Um, on, on terms of the three iReady assessment windows, do we coordinate with teachers on what the timing of those three assessments should be for optimal, um, I don't know, information for them to, to direct their teaching? So I do know that the data and assessment committee last spring uh, did have input into the development of those windows. I think there is a tension between between um, uh, in particular the third diagnostic and then the CASP. And um, there's an interval there of several weeks of, um, of instructional time that we wanna make sure um, is, uh, you know, that, that teachers have the data that they need to make the instructional choices prior to CASP that they need to support students to, to improve on that assessment. Um, we, we're looking forward to having exactly those conversations as part of the, this work group mm -hmm. and getting that information from teachers. They, they are pretty elastic. I mean, there are multiple weeks within those windows, 
but there are there are competing pressures and competing priorities that have to be navigated around that. So I would not say we have it perfected by any means at this point. Okay, but it's a conversation. Yep. So that that's all I was curious about. Um, when you talk about supplemental supports in grades six through twelve tutorial periods, is that in addition to SSR or is that referring to SSR? Well, it's the well. Ian, help me out here. Okay. Can you use the mic so the Zoom people can hear you? Otherwise, you want to go up? No. Uh, yeah, so it's not just SSR anymore at the high schools. It's SSR tutorial. So the students actually uh, have like flexibility to kind of move around to different classrooms where they need support if they've got to retake a test or if they need support in making up an assignment or homework, then they can move around during that time. Okay. Just at the high schools. Okay. Thank you. Um, and with my last 18 seconds on the mindset and culture, um, I, I'm hoping that part of that is a uh, move towards error analysis and mastery um, so that our historically underperforming students have an opportunity to learn as trustee Canova was talking about from our mistakes. Um, and this way it's not such a punitive thing to fail in math, but it's a learning opportunity. Um, is that something we're going to try to move towards? Yes, it's something that the teachers who are focused on implementing equitable grading practices, for example, have definitely moved in that direction. And that's a conversation that we're going to support the math department chairs to continue to engage all of their math teachers. I'm a big believer in consistency in grading practices versus idiosyncrasy in grading practices, as students have to navigate multiple teachers in the course of the day. Um, I uh, totally understanding of some philosophical differences, but you have to look at the data and that includes the failure rate data in your own classes. Um, as you think about what, what, what are the opportunities for redemption, retake, um, and learning that students have, uh, aside from the first shot. Thank you so much. Redemption retake, uh, trustee Muirhead. I think one thing that I think is important to emphasize is all of the math language routines that Brad mentioned earlier, Mr. Sam mentioned earlier, um, that were developed out of Stanford emphasize mistakes should be celebrated. And that's something that we're really focusing on in the math six cohort and the geometry cohort is that mistakes are evident that you're learning. And so students who are just getting the correct answer over and over again, aren't actually learning. They already knew it. Right. And so we need to be celebrating mistakes and that is already underway with those cohorts, but we see it happen regularly across our classes as well. We talk about failing forward. And we focus on that a lot in the UCube summer school programs as well. Trustee Muirhead. Thank you. I had a dad who was an engineer and I love math. So it's, it's not, it doesn't always end up that way. Um, but I also had a child who, um, you could tell it was bright with math. If you you know said two plus two, they knew it was four. But if I said a sentence like, or had them read a sentence or try to read a sentence that said, you have two apples and your friend gives you two more apples. Now, how many apples do you have? Would have no clue and did very poorly on all of the math, um, the math assessments because they couldn't read. And so um, it, all of this work on um, math um, mathematics is is very important, but it doesn't help if the student can't read. So I just want to emphasize that literacy um, is critical, um, even in in math scores. Um, I had uh, I think kind of two questions. Um, one is you mentioned a couple of times how um, you've got these cohorts of teachers, but there were a couple of teachers who were not in the cohort. Um, working on training. And I, I 
I was wondering if teachers are given the choice to opt out of training on our curriculum, because that doesn't make a whole lot of sense to me. Um, I know we have a lot of new teachers who have never been trained, but the fact that we have we are offering this training and some are opting out. Um, if you could maybe explain how that works or, or why that's happening. And the other thing is um, you were emphasizing in our scores, 40% of our students are Latino and they're, the scores are, for Latinos are so much um, lower. And um, besides the, the one section that you had about um, mindset and culture, yeah, mindset and culture, um, you have a lot of other things that we're going to be doing or are doing, can you talk about how those are focused on our Latino students to improve their, um, their math abilities? So with regard to the former, this, uh, this is a, these are supplemental um, resources as part of a new course design. And we're, are adopting an, a, um, an invitational strategy um, to engage teachers um, in these cohorts. At some point in the future, we may make it mandatory if it becomes part of the base curriculum. So a, an example for teachers who are new to the district who are being onboarded to the district curricula, those trainings will be mandatory for those teachers. Um, there, there are nuances that if you want to say anything more about this, you're welcome to, but where we are I was trying to point out the high level of uh, participation in these uh, uh, these professional development initiatives. Um, but I'm thinking about the students in those two teachers classes where all of these teachers are being trained on where we're going, except all the students in those two classrooms. So I'm thinking about those two classrooms full of students. So great that however, you know, whatever percentage it is that are getting it are getting it. but we should be giving it to all of them. And, you know, who are those students that are in those classrooms? I mean, it's like when we rolled out all of the high tech stuff in the classrooms and teachers seem to have the choice about whether to put in a smart board or not. And so the, the students in those classrooms were not getting the opportunities. You know, they opted out of the training and they opted out of the whiteboard and they weren't getting the opportunities that the rich experiences that I could see other students having in classrooms where those teachers had been trained and got the equipment. And it was just because the teacher said, eh, I don't want to. And, and, they, and their students are missing out. So why are we letting our teachers opt out of these programs that are going to be to the benefit of their students? We are very hopeful that all, all the teachers, um, that the teachers who are not participating will see the value, but it is really up, the proof is in the pudding. So to look at the evidence of student learning and the student outcomes in those classes, plus the opportunity to collaborate with colleagues, to share practices, to be part of a robust teacher community, those are all very attractive incentives for um, teachers to join. We know with diffusion of innovation theory that the summer early adopters, summer wait and seers, we wanna be respectful around that. Um, uh, unless we have, you know, specific um, mandates, this is not at the mandate stage at this point with regard to math, six, and geometry. Um, but I, I hear you, and I think we want we want the outcomes and the experience to be the incentive um, to get 100% participation. And I won't take more? more of my time, but um, I did have a second question that uh, Mr. Sam hasn't addressed yet. Yeah, that's that's fine, Jody. Yeah. Sorry, Trustee Muirhead. Hey, yeah. Finish that up. So. I think a lot of this comes back to structures, systems and structures that our district doesn't have and that we really need to work towards. Um, and so that's that's a big one. I wouldn't put um, the ability of a teacher to opt into things on the teacher necessarily, um, because right now we're asking teachers with a lot of these committees to opt in, really to opt out of their classroom environment up to nine or 10 times a year, right? And so it's a big ask because we don't have a professional learning structure that allows us to push into their workday. We're asking them to come out to us and leave their students. And so it's one of the big things that um, a lot, we've had a, a couple exploratory groups go out in the state of California and look at lots of different structures out there that exist that allow to have common preps across the district with master scheduling and bell scheduling. And there's lots of creative, innovative, amazing things happening out there where it allows for professional learning to happen within the school day and not pull teachers out. 
And um, actually, once Math Pathways um, hopefully goes the way we all hope it does, um, that's kind of my next big priority is small learning communities and looking at how to look, evaluate our structures and enhance our structures so that we can have these structures in place that allows teachers to get the professional learning that they want and they need. And as we all know, time is the four letter word in education. And unfortunately, we're not giving our teachers the time to actually collaborate in the way that they want to. So I, I don't think having continuing along with having these opt outs and having teachers come out to committees and pulling them out of the classroom is the structure that we should be utilizing, but it's the only thing we have. Um, and I'll just go on to say that the four district days of learning are amazing and Karen and her dean does an amazing job or Tosa is doing an amazing job, but that should be supplemental to a professional learning plan. It shouldn't be the only thing we offer, right? And so it, I think it is a good opportunity to your point. I think it's a great opportunity to just reevaluate how we do things, be creative and innovative, like we ask our, our students and teachers to be, um, and really think like thoroughly around what our structures are so that we can have our teachers be put in a position where they can, they can do these amazing things that we're asking them to do. So that's just my two cents. <laughs> Uh, I'd like to comment and just give kind of an alternate perspective, just kind of from the teacher's point of view. Mr. Baldwin uh, already kind of covered some of what I was going to say. But before we tar and feather the teachers that have decided not to do this at this point, um, every new thing is the next great thing. At some point, the thing that those teachers are doing right now was the next great thing. Uh, like Mr. Baldwin said, taking time out of your classroom is a, an extra burden. It's time away from your students. All due respect to substitute teachers, uh, but a sub day is not always the most diligent work day for any students. So before we kind of highly critique these teachers, I think we should find out exactly what their rationale is. Thank you. I had that second question. Can you repeat the question? <laughs> um, I was wondering, uh, of the changes that you are doing for this year and proposing for this year, besides the ones that are specifically listed on that mindset and culture page, I think it was called. So the the rest of the changes, um, what are focused on Latino students since since that does seem to be a, an important target to reach? Yeah, I think it's a great it's a great question, and we have more work to do to think about. Um, specific focus, I'm definitely the supplemental supports issue in terms of prioritizing students for those supports and making additional investment in support um, after school, summer. Um, that's one area. I think instructional practices that, that center students that are grounded in growth mindset and allow students to talk and to, to try out theories and strategies where they can feel smart using math um, and not just the kids who have already been identified as being you know, good at math, being the ones to dominate uh, the conversation in the classroom. I think those equitable and engaging instructional practices that are in the new math framework are a critical part of this. And I think familiarity with math test vocabulary and with the math structures to build confidence by all students, particularly if English is your second language, um, is also a key strategy um, for uh, building the confidence of all of the students. One thing that I didn't mention about the CASP is that the CASP, while it has high stakes for school districts and schools and principals um, frequently, um, it has relatively low stakes for students. It's not like the old high school exit exam, for example, um, or an SAT uh, and so, or an AP test. So we have to figure out how to engage students around the meaningfulness of it and how actually Proficiency can have post-secondary benefit um, to students as well. Um, so, um, and as well as other benefits. So um, that that's one thing that I didn't mention as much that that we do need to work on intentionally. Yeah, I always wonder how diligent some of our, especially 11th graders are when they take those tests. Right. Thank you. Uh, Trustee Ryan. Um, I don't have lots of comments. I'm was excited to be on the Math Pathways Committee, so I know we're doing a lot of work there. I did want to, I know that this was a very tight turnaround on this presentation, so I really appreciate the effort that went into it and all of the people who have contributed to it. Um, you know, it's been an issue, uh, you know, this has been a long-term issue in the district in terms of our math achievement, as, your, as the data shows. 
um, for years and years. So I do feel like there's now a sense of urgency to it, um, which I appreciate. And, and I do remember, I remember um, in one district where I worked, one of the teachers who sort of led a professional development and was like, you know, the results are the results, right? And you want to know how your students are doing. And it's not a critique of, of anything you've done necessarily. It's if they didn't get it, they didn't get it. We need to do something else, right? So um, being supportive of teachers in that, that we just want to learn how to do it better. And I think the data shows us that we have room to grow um, and looking forward to finding ways to do that. So thank you. Thank you, Trustee Ryan. Um, I will um, comment and then we'll, I have no slips, but we'll ask if there's any comment from those in the public or on the Zoom. And then we will come back um, to the board so that we do one round first. Um, so when Bre Mr. Stam and I met uh, last week and he sh uh, showed me his initial um, draft, I said, I was expecting 10 slides. So this was a way over achievement, and I mentioned that then. So um, thank you so much. And I appreciated the transparency with the data because sometimes we don't want to show the data that's hard to look at. Um, and so again, thank you for that. I did have some questions, um, and I want to start with where this before I get there, where the my requests stem from. When the math pathways, um, before that presentation, I had a conversation with the employee who offhandedly mentioned, it would be great if we could get back to common assessments. And having worked at the high school when there was common assessments, I was unaware that common assessments had evaporated. And I kind of went into a panic as a parent of, children who are in the middle school knowing that how do I know if my child's class is getting what your child's class is getting, what your child's class we have, we don't know. We have no way to gauge if our curriculum is being followed. And as a parent, that was very concerning. Um, which is why I felt the sense of an urgency not only for all the students, but for the students that are living in my home right now. And um, so I'm so grateful that, what, again, this was way an overachieving. I, I was just hoping for actually common assessments. That's it was my, I was like, please let that come back because that's the way we know if we're teaching our curriculum. So can I ask one question um, to kind of go with what trustee um, Muirhead said on your assessment page, um, you mentioned encouraging the interim assessments and you talked about the common assessments. We're starting that committee. That's great. Um, do It would be great if the board could get updates on, on when classes are finished as far as common assessments. But I'm also con was concerned because it says recommend, and I heard you say encourage, if my question is, are if these are going to be required? We want, we're in the process of building out a multi-year plan. And we wanna do that with the robust participation of the teachers and the department chairs um, and the TOSAs. And I, there is a lot of interest expressed in the use of common assessments at the high school level. Um, and like I said, we have iReady at the middle school level and there's concerns about over-testing, et cetera. So we, were, we wanted to recommend trying them for, familiar, for familiarity, but not necessarily doing a, a full battery um, this year. But I, I believe that you know, within a few years, we can have a robust set of common assessments across grade levels, across subject areas that are being regularly tuned or grounded in the essential standards um, and where teachers are playing a key role in their refinement and development, because then you get you get the investment, you get the buy-in, you get the ownership. And they, we can also ensure that they are being reviewed externally for validity and reliability as well. Um, and absolutely, the bank, the interim assessment blocks that are available in this from Smarter Balanced are a first stop for those. Um, 
because they're high quality and aligned to standards. Okay, thank you. My time's up. I'll have to come back to that. Do we didn't have any slips in the public? Do we have from any members of the public? Do we have any members of the public who would like to speak? Okay, you can line up at the mic. Our cameras just went down. Do we have sound? We have sound. So we will continue um, with uh, sound only until they fix the cameras. I believe that's fine. Fine. It's a, now a podcast. Yes. Uh, um, but any members, hold on a second. <laughs> any members who are participating on the Zoom who would like to speak, now is the time to raise your hand. We will start in the room and then go out in the Zoom. And this is your time to speak on this Es tu this math. Su tiempo de poder hablar. Uh, las personas que están en el Zoom, por favor. For your time to speak on math pathways. I mean, Adelante. Math path sobre las trayectorias de matemáticas. Okay. I'll hold. Yeah. Or is that fixed? Ya está listo. Is the translation working now? Yes. Okay, we will now go out for public comment. Uh, Ms. Waisaki. Thank you. Um, a couple of things. So um, I'm not here to argue the data, um, but I think it's really imperative we understand that when we're talking about our Latinx, our Hispanic community for a math test, if we can't control for the language, I don't know how we're assessing for math understanding. So one of the things we were in a meeting, it was just yesterday at DLT, we were talking about, can we turn on the ability to have for, for math, not for ELA, to turn on um, the language piece so that the kiddos can read the iReady in their native language. And um, there is that possibility to do as well on CASP. And I feel like we need to look into that so that we know that the scores that we're getting are actually math scores and not language scores. My second comment has to do with um, data is fascinating, but data needs to be really critically looked into. And we need to start making some associations with our data, start pulling out disaggregating information. Like if you're looking at the, at your, at the scores of the kids who were performing at the lowest level, is there a correlation between that and attendance? Because if you're not in the classroom, it's hard to learn. So let's be mindful that it's not just the scores we have to be critical in looking deeper than just numbers. Is there anyone else in the room that would like to speak at this time? Okay, I do not see any hands raised on the Zoom, so we're closing public comment on this. Uh, Trustee Raderman, you have some more to speak. Yeah, there, there were a couple of comments earlier that were made, and I'm not trying to single anybody out, um, but um, and sometimes these comments worry me. Um, it doesn't mean I don't want to hear them. I do want to hear them. Um, but for instance, uh, Director Baldwin mentioned that we don't have a professional learning structure that works, okay, or that is robust enough. I don't know how you'd want to characterize that. The concern I have is why we don't. You know, why don't we have that? Is it because it's just just there's a process that just takes time to get done? Uh, is it because we don't have adequate resources? Is it something the board has done to prevent you from being able to gain the resources, the either the human resources, the material resources, whatever they are to get the job done? Is it a budget restriction? And if those are the things that are preventing us from doing what we need to do to really help our kids, 
then I personally, as a board member, would like to see that come back to the board and say, hey, listen, by the way, if we had this, 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 and this, we could do some really cool stuff. Um, because sometimes people, I think, are afraid to ask the board or, you know, well, you've approved the budget, you're stuck with the budget, don't come back. We can amend that. We can change that. Mark is rolling over in his grave over here. He's not in a grave yet, but he may be shortly. But at any rate, um, I think, some, I don't always speak eloquently. Um, at any rate, I do think, I do think that's important. I mean, we want success. And so if there's something in our way, and particularly if it's something coming from this board, time, for instance, time is usually the one that everybody says, time to some extent can be uh, addressed by adding human resource and then doing critical pathway analysis and, and this type of thing, uh, critical chain analysis. So there's a lot of ways to maybe get to where we need to go. And if those are things that are really critical to our success, um, I want us to be able to weigh in and help and try to take care of it. Thanks. Sorry about your early demise. The only thing that I would say is that you're asking us to think boldly and ambitiously, and we will design a bold and ambitious plan um, and we, uh, the slide around structures, resources, and policies was intentionally called out because I do believe and I do agree with Mr. Baldwin that there are some structural impediments that cause us to over rely on certain forms of professional development. And we miss the opportunities to do other much more job embedded learning um, through the design of current design of our structures, our school structures, our bell schedules, our master schedules. And I think there's a lot of opportunity there um, to, to, to leverage the potential of that to the benefit of our teachers and students. Well, thank you for bringing it forward. We'll look forward to hearing more about it. Thanks. Thank you, uh, Trustee Raderman, um, student Trustee Valdez. I just, before he starts speaking, I just, I leaned over to him and I said, do you have any thoughts about this? And he said, yes. And I said, then you've got to speak. So I'm, I'm making him speak. So go for it. Thank you so much. And thank you so much for the presentation. One of the best traits that a teacher could have is the conversations that are remembered with the students for many years to come. And sometimes math is a subject that can degrade students through induced anxiety and depression and different forms of stresses. So what does that mean? <laughs> that means that Teachers should have the space and opportunity to speak to the human aspect of which students don't receive enough of, clearly indicated by the numbers. So teachers will often have to, will often need to have conversations with students, which allow them to feel motivated in order to want to excel in mathematics because students can easily become discouraged, especially when they are coming from lower served communities. And the way that that could take effect is through incentivizing students to want to succeed. Because if students fall off the trails very quickly, it is very hard for them to come back up if there's no support system. And if there's no support system within the classroom as a direct form of the teacher or students, then they're pretty much lost. So you need the students to be the anchor of which will keep the students on track. And incentivizing students to want to perform well in math can look different in many ways, but one of the main ways that it could look like is if a student is doing well in a class academically, by that grade, they can receive different things such as free snacks or free <laughs> incentives. Because I remember that this is exactly what they had in Cabrillo, in Cabrillo Middle School. Uh, we had our Cougar passes and students would compete with each other of uh, friendly competitiveness in order to see who would get the free snacks, right? And this aspect I feel has been lost throughout the years of being able to humanize a subject that dehumanizes people. So that's my idea. Thank you. Trustee Can Canova. I, I want I want to Will you speak for me next time? <laughs> that that was so beautiful. Thank you. You know, it's I'll give a, another example. Um, some of you may know that my, my son is in the ADHD spectrum and he's a young adult, but we've been learning Python code together. And there's a connection here to the whole mathematics thing. You know, you can study the rules around writing code, but if you really want to do code, do code, write the code. 
when you're on the Python platform and you write bad code like dad does, you get all this red text back. And I'm trying to figure out what did I do wrong with the code? And then David, my son will go, dad, just da, 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 da. boom, the code is good. And I think mathematics is the same thing. It goes back to that fear of failure that the, what the comment you made about degrading. If you, if you wanna be good at math, do the math with no fear, no fear. Do the math and you'll get the math. The more you do the coding, the better coder you'll become. The more you do the math, the better you'll be at math. No fear here. Do it and do it and do it again and you will succeed. Trusty Lieberman. I just wanted to say that I am also um, incentivized by snacks. So <laughs> if anybody would like to incentivize me with snacks, I'll take them. Thank you. Had a, a trustee Muirhead. I I really appreciate what our students said, and and that is why we want to have you up here is to hear your um your viewpoint. And um, he talks about incentivizing, and I was never one to like pay my kids for grades. I I just didn't like that. I I like the intrinsic versus the extrinsic. But there's different ways. I think teachers and and teachers. I'm not going to teach teachers how to teach because teachers know all these bags of tricks, but it it, it says something about uh, having an interesting and engaging classroom and um, differentiating. You know, we we I was at one of the math pathways and and someone who had a um, uh, a kid who was excelling was worried about taking out some of those opportunities and and a parent whose child was struggling was worried about what was going to happen when they all got into the same geometry class and it's like. That's what teachers do, and and I um, I am kind of excited to see um, as we move forward with this the creativity of our teachers because I think that that is so critical for wherever the students are low middle or high or I don't even like those words but wherever they are um, with their math that teachers can make that child do better. And whether, you know, if they're, if they're high, make them higher. And if they're in the middle, they, they could move up and, and ways to share strategies among our teachers. That's why I'm concerned about these two teachers who aren't doing, or however many it is that aren't doing um, the training is, is that those teachers can share and, and learn more strategies. There's always more things to learn. We have a great set of TOSAs and, and teacher leaders who can um, help our teachers really make the classes engaging for all students so that they aren't scared of math, that they know that they can do this um, and they can get better. It, they don't have to be the top student, but they can get better. Um, I think I, I'm trying to reflect what you're saying and, and put it into, into a context that I can understand that um, I don't have to give a child a bag of Fritos. I, I, there's other things a teacher can do, um, but it's making them excited about their classes. You have to ask trustee for your time. President. Yes, you may share again. And then we will go out to the Zoom to trustee Gonzalez. Just a quick thing to add to that. If students are not incentivized to succeed within their household, it makes it very hard for them to succeed by themselves. And if there is no support system that exists inside the households for them to want to achieve greatness, then the teachers must be the anchor that combines both of them to want to succeed. And this is a very evident thing in math and in the Hispanic household, because I do come from one, this is something that is quite commonplace because there is nobody that tells you that this is what you should be achieving and this is what you should be doing. So that oftentimes makes you unaware of where you should be and this teachers have the excellent opportunity in order to allow students to succeed. So incentivizing students is perhaps one of the last resorts, but it may be the most effective one to allow students to succeed. Thank you. Thank you. Trustee Gonzalez. Thank you. There. Okay. I think, um, the presentation was great. I think uh, understanding the data is is good a good starting point. And uh, 
as I mentioned earlier, I think that uh, what we have as far as some plan is is uh, good. Um, we definitely, uh, I mentioned this before, you know, our system is perfectly set up to give us the results that we get. So I'm glad that we're, we're looking at changes. Uh, we understand that students uh, definitely are, are part of the equation, households are part of the equation. How we understand our students uh, is very important. Um, I think I mentioned before that we should have an IEP for each student, right? Basically understanding that um, what's going on in, in, in their household, wh wh what kind of household do they come from? You know, basically uh, different students, even Latinx students are different. I can tell you my boys were, were much better off as far as uh, education, just because you know their mother was uh, a high school math teacher who taught in our district for 14 years, right? So th there's 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 a whole spectrum as far as how they come, e even the language, uh, whether they're coming from Guatemala recently, or which they don't even speak Spanish in certain cases, right? So we, we can't just uh, focus on on some generalization, but we definitely have to understand this, each child. And I think our teachers are at the forefront of understanding that. And uh, if they are empowered to basically reach out and say, we need these resources or this uh, collaboration, um, I think it's important for us to listen to them. It's important for us to make sure that they have the resources that, that they uh, require. We, we do have more resources in other, other neighboring districts. And I remember one of our neighboring high school districts, our neighbor high school district uh, years ago, they implemented uh, basically a, 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 a wasn't a principal special, but basically they had a dean of students that oversaw their, their high schools. Anybody that was getting a D or an F, he was aware of it, you know, and, and I think our teachers, our staff, our uh, educational leaders need to be on, at, at every site, need to understand what's going on with each student. Basically have a war room or what have you, you open the door, names are on there. This student hasn't been in class for, for a week or a few days. Have our, our, uh, our, our folks who are responsible for that go and reach out and see where they're at. You know, maybe so. Basically, definitely understanding the child. Um, our teachers are, have a lot on their plate already, so we, we definitely need them to. They need they need assistance, whether it's PD or any other thing. You know, we they need to be able to be empowered to reach out to us. And as uh, Trustee Radon mentioned, you know, we we have resources, and it's like okay, the budget is the budget, but how do we make sure that that our teachers have the resources needed to make sure that our students succeed? And I think I, I believe we're moving in, in the right direction. Um, it's, it's always frustrating when we look at the numbers, but um, you know, what, whatever we can do to improve the lives of our students, that's what we got to do. Um, thank you. I, I would like to just be the last commenter and then we can let, let Mr. Stam, let Mr. Stam go home because I can see you starting to melt. <laughs> okay. Um, I just had a couple of questions I wanted to get answered. Is there a curriculum map for the secondary for each class? I mean, like kind of a guideline scope and sequence. Okay. Um, and so then great, that should make common assessments much easier. Um, and then for the math and six and geometry cohorts, we say these things are happening in the classroom. How do we know they're happening in the classroom? Thank you. Um, as part of the cohorts, the teachers get coaching conversations or classroom support from me. I have already been making the rounds to the classrooms of the participating teachers to see and help with implementation of the strategies that we're looking at. Some of that looks like me co-teaching with teachers. Other times it's classroom observations. Other times it's planning conversations. I've also looked at the data or like students have done Mars tasks and we've collected them and analyzed that data together. Um, so those are all... And the ways and then I have a configuration map for how I'm calibrating levels of implementation. And these are the sites. ones that have opted in. Yeah. So every sixth grade teacher like with, and then all but with the exception of those two um, geometry teachers. Okay. And and you made a statement about um, we've we know we're learning when we're failing and then learn. Um, what what are some things that teachers can do um, that help students like maybe who have had a bad test or how do how do we how do we deal with that because that's one of the big setbacks with math is it's really easy to bomb something yeah. so yeah so 
what we already know is happening across, I can confidently say every single site, maybe not every classroom, but the vast majority of teachers in our the math departments, our students are allowed to do retakes at any point for their assessments. They're encouraged to do so. I hear language all the time, like you don't know it yet. That was your first opportunity to learn. It was not your only opportunity to learn. I was in um, a, I can't remember, it was a sixth grade math class or a seventh grade math class a couple of weeks ago, where the students, every one of them had a picture of a brain taped in their notebook. And every time they made a mistake, they put a star on their brain. So they knew that their brain grew in that mistake, um, which is a really cool visual way of like, I made, you know, 27 mistakes this week or whatever, because they're, they wanted their brain to have as many stars as possible, because we know when you, you know, the students have learned through um, the week of inspirational math from UCube that when you make mistakes, your brain fires neurons, it makes your brain physically grow. Um, and so they had that representation in their notebook. I see teachers all the time when I'm in classrooms saying to students, thank you so much for making that mistake. We had this awesome conversation because you made that mistake and we couldn't have talked like that. We couldn't have learned had you not done that. So those things are happening, not as frequently as we know they could be, but there are instances across the district where things like that are happening and celebrated and retakes are allowed. And so creating more structures for all those common practices take place across the district is essential. Thank you so much. One of the things I think that would be helpful as, um, as a board is the accountability piece. And so it would be great to have some sort of a check-in or it doesn't have to be formal, but you know, when you're in the weekly email, something that says, you know what, this is what we accomplished. Um, so that it's not just a presentation and then that's forgotten about, which often happens. We see great presentations and we never hear the follow-up and we want to hear the follow-up and we don't want it to just be the data. We want it to be the, the stories and what's going on. And this is what we've accomplished according to our plan. And I really appreciate you taking it seriously. I didn't know you take it this seriously, but I really appreciate you taking this challenge from this board seriously because we do feel a sense of urgency as a collective board towards meeting the needs of our students. So I really, again, I want to thank you for that. And um, we will end your presentation and let you go home. Thank you, Ewa. Thank you. And thanks again to the team for all their amazing work. Okay, our next item that may or may not have as much participation is our district facility condition assessment item P.1. So, <clears throat> first of all, you can still really clear out a room. <laughs> And second, two more people that know math or that understand math and think about math. So um, unfortunately, you're going to have a little bit more math tonight. Um, tonight represents the culmination of a project that started almost 21 months ago when we submitted an RFQ out to do a facilities condition needs assessment. Um, this report that's in front of you this evening, and I think Trustee Muirhead was estimating that there is about 50 pages for every district facility. We have over 30 facilities um, and it is a comprehensive analysis of every single one of our district owned properties and an estimated cost, um, a replacement cost or um, cost to bring those items up to uh, code or for replacement when they end their useful life. This is going to be a document for us that will be very important to the work that we do going forward. It'll be a budget document. It will be a project document. It will be a planning document and really assist um, all of our teams as we move forward in thinking about um, each one of those building components having that useful life and what do we need to do and plan for those replacements or, or future projects. So Michelle's going to get into much more of the details behind it. Uh, we're going to try to keep it at high level presentation uh, that will be available for questions after that.
And Mark just basically summarized the entire presentation, so I can uh, I can go a little faster. Um, thing never works for me. Okay. So as Mark said, we started this per this process about 21 months ago, and uh, we went out for an RFP for our current architects who work for us. And um, HY Architects was the architect that we ended up moving forward with. And this was in combination of the facility needs assessment as well as master planning every single school. So next year sometime, probably at the end of 24 in December, so we'll bring to you all the master plans that we've been working on. So this report is only our existing facilities, what we would consider maintenance projects. This is not new construction. It's not replacing portables. It's just maintaining what we already have. And I think that's something that most districts already have. It's what we use our deferred maintenance fund for and what we will be looking to fund in the future. This report also included a report that we did a facility needs assessment for our sports facilities and our fields and all of our outdoor equipment that we have. And that was done in 2018 by Verde Design. So we added that information into this report and these dollar amounts, and we did escalate them for inflation. But um, so this, this report focused mainly on buildings and then that report focused on the equipment, uh, playgrounds, and sports fields. We do have a large facility. Um, I would say 528 acres is a lot, 31 properties. And I think what's interesting about this is that we have more portables than permanent buildings. Um, and a lot of the cost on this is maintaining some of those portables. So as we look and we're looking at enrollment projections over the next 10, 20 years, we're certainly gonna be looking at replacing portables potentially with permanent buildings or just getting rid of portables altogether. And that cost is not in this in these numbers. So this is just purely basically maintenance of what we have. The facilities conditions assessment includes site amenities a little bit, um, what the Verde report did not include and included exterior finishes, roofing, electrical, lighting, plumbing, irrigation, everything that goes into building a building and keeping that building running. The methodology for assessments, um, I filled out a pre-assessment survey on every school site. The questions were, what works, what doesn't. Um, I referred to maintenance work orders, what continually breaks down. We talked to site staff and said, what floods, what leaks, um, what other concerns do you have about your site? And all that information was incorporated. The architect, as well as their consultant, reviewed some of the construction documents. We reviewed how old the buildings are, when they were last modernized, usually by the bond department, and what upgrades have been done to those buildings since they were first constructed. We went on site walks, interviewed site personnel, and then the whole basis of the report is based on the EUL, which is the expected useful life. So every piece of equipment, every building has an expected useful life. So for an HVAC unit, it might be 20 years. And so then the analysis was, when was that put in? And how many, what's the remaining useful life on it? Is it, has it been there for 15 years and now it's been five years? So that means in five years, we have to plan to replace it. And that's what the whole cost estimate is based on and how we project out over time. So the companies went out and actually looked at every single one of our HVAC units. They looked at our boilers, they looked at our water heaters, they looked at our plumbing, and just, and they could tell by some of the tags on it how old they were, when they were modernized, lighting, and then that's how they projected out the costs of replacement. The cost estimates were based on the remaining useful life, and they were also based on construction costs for Silicon Valley. And they used traditional, what we would use in cost estimating for our construction projects. Um, we used current data and then inflated it over the years for 8%. Um, I will say that we chose 8% because that's what we've been seeing construction costs go up. We have presented previously that last year, construction costs went up 24%. So some years they go up less, some years they go up more. And so we've been inflating everything at 8%. The report does not include soft costs, which can be between 30 to 45% of the project hard costs. So that's architects, that's DSA fees, 
any other approval fees, health department fees, project management fees if we have construction managers. So these costs are just to buy it and install it only. It doesn't include a replacement cost for artificial turf. We know that in 10 to 12 years, we will need to replace all of our artificial turf that we just installed at Agnew, Huerta, McDonald, Santa Clara, and Wilcox. So all of those costs will need to be added to this as a replacement. Um, it also does not include any improvements for Townsend, Elmer Johnson, and Washington Park. And that was mainly because those facilities are so old that they almost need complete replacement and that we didn't feel that putting in money to refurbish them, them was worth it. Um, and then it does not include portable, replacing portables with new construction. The piece in there also about the artificial fields. Um, it's also important to note that there is a bill that's being entered that is currently sitting on the governor's desk right now that would preclude us from having artificial fields going forward. Uh, we do not know whether Governor Newsom will sign that bill or not. And so that is also an added cost that we will need to think about going forward is not just potentially ripping out the synthetic turf that we've put in place and, repl and uh, replacing it with traditional grass turf, but also the operational impacts is that, of that as well for the increased watering that will impact our operational budget as well. Both those things are not included in this as well. So what do our costs look like? Um, year zero is this fiscal year. So between this fiscal year and two years, we are looking at $30.4 million worth of maintenance projects. Um, three through five, 96 million, six through 10, 230 million, and 11 through 20, uh, basically 750 million. So we're looking at over $1.2 billion worth of maintenance projects within the next 20 years. This does include maintenance projects that would occur on our leased sites um, and Casa del Maestro. So some of those responsibilities are on our current renters, but if they moved out, we would still be responsible for taking care of those. And this also does not include the soft costs. The assessed categories, um, we they did a very, very thorough investigation of all of our sites. And so this is the, I'll kind of review just a little bit of what's included in each of these categories. The building structure is structure. It's dry rot. It's um, in actual structural beams. It's earthquakes. So luckily we don't have a lot of that. We, uh, the bond office did a really great job of going back and seismically upgrading the majority of our permanent buildings over the past 10 years and 15 years. And so that has reduced this. A lot of districts have higher costs in this section. And so I think that we're lucky that we don't in that, that we've done a good job of mitigating that already. The exterior building materials and facade, that is your plaster on your walls. That's painting. That's a little bit of dry rot. That's not structural. Um, roofing, roofing's roofing. Interior materials and finishes, that's paint, that's tile, that's um, tackable surfaces that is on some of our, um, most of our classrooms. The kids tend to beat it up. Uh, sometimes the paint starts peeling in locations, interior and exterior. And so that's, this is specifically interior. And the finishes, ceiling tiles as well is in that. Electrical covers lighting, mostly lighting. Um, it covers a little bit of the infrastructure, but mostly just lighting and electrical outlets, upgrades that we may need. If we're putting in more computers in every classroom, we have to power them. And so right now, our current infrastructure may not be able to handle all the technology that'll be coming in the next 10 years. Things get more efficient, but we're also adding a lot more. So we may have to look at doing some trade-offs and, and upgrading our electrical on that. Plumbing, plumbing includes plumbing fixtures. Some of our plumbing fixtures that we have in our campuses are still the original plumbing fixtures that were built, that were constructed when the building was built. Um, we're still looking at some two gallon flushing toilets or more. Um, we have sinks that aren't efficient either. And so this plumbing also includes some of the um, main lines coming in. A lot of our lines is, as we do construction projects, we end up hitting the old original lines, their transite pipes. So that is included in some of this uh, cost. The HVAC 
I think everyone at this point knows that that's heating, air condition, heating ventilation, air conditioning. Um, that's pretty self-explanatory. And I think I just want to make a note that this number is also not higher because the bond office put in 144 units in 2016 in every elementary classroom. So we have to, we are putting that out there though, that we will have to replace them at some point, but that $3 million would be much higher if we hadn't done a wholesale new HVAC in all of our elementary schools. So because the bond office did that, that number is not nearly as high as it would be. And it, it is for many other districts. Elevators and lifts, that includes the little stage lifts that are on our elementary schools. So that's fairly minor. Uh, fire protection, sprinklers, fire alarm. As we add new buildings, we're gonna be having to upgrade the fire alarm. It seems like every time we do a new building, the state increases fire alarm controls and, and everything that we need to do. So um, that's just upgrading that. And a perfect example of that is what we're doing at the YAC right now at Cabrillo. We're adding a new fire alarm to that building to connect it to our existing campus. Equipment and furnishings, that is some site furnishings. That is not furniture. So that would be, that is not included in this cost at all. This is more of picnic tables, things that we would buy as a district. Um, some site furnishings, benches, picnic tables, um, tables for cafeterias, but not necessarily desks and library furniture. Shade structures includes the canopies that are roofed at the majority of our elementary schools. And I know Larry Adams in the bond office has been doing some analysis on what it would cost to structurally retrofit and re-roof them. And it's, it's a large sum of money that we haven't found the budget for. So that is, is the main reason that that 1.1 and the year two um, is, and it gets larger because those shade structures and those overhangs are, they need new roofs, they need to be structurally upgraded. And so we're still trying to figure out how to address that. The follow-up study is actually a, a ADA study for a few of our campuses on how to get a little bit better accessibility on them. Site pavement, I think the maintenance department is doing a pretty good job at addressing some schools of asphalt paving. They do about three or four every summer for deferred maintenance. Um, but as you can see, we're not doing it fast enough. Um, so we're still looking at the 4.5 million in the next two years. Site development and grounds, this includes irrigation and it also includes some of the costs to separate out our water meters. Some of our water meters, we have one meter on the campus and that's potable and irrigation. And our goal is to have two separate meters because we get charged different water rates. And so some of this is the included to separate that out. Um, turf fields, this is just the cost to redo our grass fields. If you've been out to any of our elementary schools, you know that our grass fields are really bad. They're, they're weeds and grass doesn't last forever. So our grounds department is doing the best they can with what they have, but we really need to get in a plan where we are starting over on our fields and replanting those elementary school um, grass fields. Outdoor athletic facilities, this is where the Verde report came in. This includes some swimming pool costs um, and a lot of the other, um, if, if a school site had a baseball field or a softball field on it, the cost for those improvements is in this number, not in the turf grass fields numbers. And this, luckily, once again, the bond office just redid the two, basically the two stadiums, they're redoing the bleachers at the high schools. And so this number came down quite a bit from the original Verde report because the, that all of that needed to be redone. And so with bond addressing that, that number is lower than it could have been. And then accessibility improvements, once again, that's just some ADA items. So next steps, we are, the maintenance department and my department are actively looking for some type of software to track all of this. And we're hoping that it will seamlessly integrate with our work order system. All of this information is currently in a software that the consultant used and we do have access to that and we are going to keep that and we can pull reports from that pretty at a fairly detailed level. So we have access to that until we find a new software that will integrate with our work order system. And then we're continually 
evaluating short-term and long-term funding sources as well as the projects for that. So every year uh, the maintenance department and I get together and we look at what we could potentially do that next summer, what are our highest needs, and then how much money do we have in the pot to do that. Upcoming presentations. Um, so following this in November, I will be giving a, you know, October, October 28th, uh, or the second meeting in October, um, I'll be giving another presentation on our use of facilities and an overview on that and where we are with um, our district rates and how we compare to neighboring organizations. And then the meeting after that in November will be bringing to you potentially proposed changes for use of facilities fees. And then hopefully we'll get that approved and we would hope that new use of facilities fees would be applicable to reservations starting in June and July of 24. So, any questions? Thank you so much. Short and sweet. <laughs> Short and sweet. Um, do we have any questions who would like to go first? Trustee Muirhead. So <clears throat> on slide seven, it says the total cost is 1.2 billion. How much money do we have in deferred maintenance and and over, right? We have to put money into it. Like, what do we have now? And then looking out over the next 20 years, we have to put a certain percentage in, I think, each year. And, and where would we be in 20 years with that fund? Oh, cl not even close. Well, um, I, so, I understand that. But yeah. So the routine know. restricted maintenance account by law is required to be a set aside annual or every year your routine restricted maintenance is 3% of your annual general fund budget. Um, so on a three on nearly four hundred million dollar project, that's about twelve million dollars a year. We pay for projects every we we have expenses out of that, and then we transfer anything remaining in that into our deferred maintenance account. So, um, and I don't have that number. I'll look it up here shortly and get that to you um, as to how much money we have carried over in our deferred maintenance budget as of the end of June thirtieth of last year, uh, and that's that money is sitting in fund fourteen. Um, fund 14, yes. Um, we are leveraging those resources on projects to, uh, as Michelle said, on projects that we're currently doing. Uh, one of the things that, in addition to the next steps, one of the things that we are also doing is um, Michelle and Adam are leading this project, is I task them with developing a matrix that we can use to evaluate projects. It's not uncommon or wouldn't be a surprise to you to hear that we constantly hear, you know, I really wish we could do this or I wish we could do that. And we get this laundry list of projects. And so really what we're going to do is develop a matrix that we can evaluate these projects against. So that way, those that, you know, like fire life safety ones, those get a higher priority than those things that are nice to have, but aren't necessarily required to have. So that way we can take the res financial resources that we have available and be logical with the projects that we, we tackle while also doing this important work in regards to our deferred maintenance projects as well. Uh, one of the other conversations and not kind of directly related to what you said, uh, Trustee Muirhead, is also looking at the staffing within our maintenance and operations department. Um, a lot of this work, we can extend the useful life of some of these systems with pro proper preventative maintenance as well. But in order to do that proper preventative maintenance, we need to make sure that we have the correct staffing allocations as well. And so we're going to be looking at the staffing resources within our maintenance operations department to see if there's something that we can do in there that would allow us to be able to do more preventative maintenance that would also allow us to extend the useful life of some of these systems as well. And then I'm going to go get my computer and I'm going to figure out the answer to your dollar amount question. Yeah, I, I didn't get any dollar values uh, yeah. out of what you just said. So, and and if it takes a little time, that's fine. Okay. You can, you can let us know. Um, the other question I had is I was at um, uh, a school recently and they were pointing out um, all of the peeling paint and how it hadn't been painted in a while. And um, so on page, I'm not going to, page 197 out of 517 on this document. Um, well, anyway, so there's various um, site information for each site and then a condition. So poor, fair, and up. And um, and I'm wondering, like, if something is rated poor, that doesn't sound very good. And I'm surprised that 
like our Williams report or whatever that report is that says the condition is is not we're we're not getting um we don't we don't have to say anything about these things but the things that are poor so what what's the next step on those if it's um you know it might not be an emergency thing but you it's rated poor so what are we doing so that our our schools look and feel maintained so the rating poor is um so they had good fair poor and then like emergency um so everything in the emergency list that they identified is in year zero so that's part of that cost everything that's in poor is in for the most part in the first two years and and saying that we need to replace that now so i can pull a list of and we have the list of everything that's poor um and it will give us everything that they rated as poor the school site what it is and basically what needs to be done with it so um i think that's where you're seeing those numbers of why those numbers in years zero to two are so high because everything that's poor including painting some of those schools is is included in those numbers so it would be interesting to know if we have enough money in that fund to cover all of those we don't um, no not right. even for the emergency and poor the emergency we do the poor we don't and and is that the only fund that is accessible to this type of work well no because these could be general fund expenses as well so it could come out of the general fund um these these are expenses that you know maintaining your facilities as a general fund expense so it could come out of the general fund it could become from funds other restricted funds for as long as it meets the definition of that um you know we are hopeful we are hearing that there is the possibility of a statewide bond measure in november 2024 we have projects that are sitting up in sacramento waiting to be funded uh, or to be reimbursed for and then that may allow us to go ahead and tackle some of these projects as well so there's the possibility of doing that um, i think it's also you're correct it doesn't you know when i talk about that matrix you know painting does not rise to the level of a fire life safety system but it does have a causal relation because that serves as a barrier to whatever that paint is being adhered to and if there is no paint there then it starts degrading that whatever is underneath that whether it's plaster or something that can rust and then that has a, a causal relation as well so that's where that matrix comes in to be able to help us evaluate yeah it might only be paint but we need to do that painting project because if we don't it's going to have this other causal relation well, and not just that, but it, when students and teachers see a rundown campus and parents or community members see a rundown campus that doesn't have nice landscaping and the paint, you know, they, they don't even walk on campus and they see peeling paint. I mean, that's an, that's an indication of w what's important to the community. And if our schools are not important, they're not going to send their kids to our schools. Or they're not going to, you know make an effort 100 percent accurate there's actually research out there that talks about the 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 psychological effect that mm -hmm. um just the outward appearance has of a school has on a student before they ever enter Absolutely. into the classroom or into the building environment mm -hmm. so you're 100 percent correct and that's one of the reasons why having this type of a document will help us to be able to address these issues going forward and if we know that we don't have the funding it's finding the way to go ahead and make those proposals on how we can do these projects thank you oh. thank you uh trustee ratterman yes thank you so mark you and i've been talking quite a while now about about replacement values, et cetera. And so this report goes a long way towards addressing a lot of those, particularly the capital costs. I think there are a lot of things that aren't in here. If, I, if I'm reading this thing correctly, there's no computer-based uh, you know, replacements in there. There's no bus place replacements. Things like that are not in this study. Is that correct? You're it's correct. Shaking hands. Yeah, you're <laughs> correct. And that was intentional. This is specifically looking at core facilities. I will say technology services is currently working on a technology replacement cycle. And we are currently doing the exact same thing for our, all of our vehicles as well. So we are we are mirroring this internally by doing it uh, for those other two systems as well. I think that's fantastic. And so it, what I'd love to see is sort of at some point, in the near future. I noticed that slide 11 talks about continued evaluation, short-term, long-term funding sources. A lot of my questions, as well as I think the direction that Trustee Muirhead was going, had to do with how we're going to pay for all this. And it, it combines it together. I'd like to see a global look of what our 
earn rate is, if that's probably an inappropriate use of the term, but but where we're at, what we need to set aside. I mean, I ran my own spreadsheet, danger, danger. Um, you know, and we're looking at for the first three years, we're looking at an average of 10 million a year. So that's that's manageable. The next the next three years, it's 28 million a year. The next 21 years, because you've got 21 years up on the board, is 57 million per year on average. Now, obviously, it's way to the back, which is throwing around with things. But, you know, where do we come up with these funds? How do we get this? And this is one slice of our requirements when we start adding buses and IT and computers and things like that to it. So that's something that's really Im Im important to me. Um, I did see, and you answered most of my questions ahead of time on the leased, the leased properties. Most of those look like they're offset currently by current leases, at least some of the big ones I was able to read through the detail on. So that's great. So those, there's $58 million in lease revenue that we need to come up with. It looks like that most of that will be handled by someone else unless they move out. One just got extended uh, two years ago for 15 years. So um, the other thing is on the facilities that's coming up, it's the next report. Can I just finish this? Thank you. Um, the facilities is one of the, the, the future reports coming up um, on facilities fees. And you know, that's an issue that, that I have a lot of passion behind. So I'd, before we come back with a, like a finished project, I would like to see that kind of come to the board to make sure that we're giving you input into, and, and my, my passion may not be the one that prevails, but at any rate that we're giving you input. So you go through, when you go through all the work to do that, you don't come back and have us say, okay, start over again. So thank you. If I can respond, um, that is part of our, that is our process. Uh, we intentionally took what could have easily been a one board meeting conversation and elongated this out over four board meetings. So that way we could piecemeal a lot of this conversation, get input on it before finalizing it. So that that second and third board meeting will be really providing that information. We can then go back, make some tweaks based upon uh, the board's comments to us in order to bring that hopefully to the board for approval at the December board meeting. Uh, the reason why we've targeted that December board meeting is um, our users know that we are doing this work. And Michelle's had some great conversations with our users and has committed to, to the greatest extent possible, about a six-month window for a communication plan. So that's why then we have an effective date targeting that June to July period. So it, it has been a very strategic process, uh, to, to your point, Trustee Ratterman. Thank you. And I look forward to that global overview. Thanks. Thank you. Trustee Canova. No, thank you, Michelle. I am Mark for very concise. I love your presentation. It's going like it's so much subject matter, and you put so much of it into such a concise but thorough presentation. I, I really do appreciate it. I like the focus on the matrix in terms of the preventative maintenance because that's so critical. I think when we um, build new schools, new facilities, there's a lot of excitement about that, but there's not a lot of excitement around maintaining things that we have. And, um, and it's so important because that really gives us a longer life of that use of that facility. So I wanna see more about that as you develop it. That's very interesting to me. I wanna see that because I really do think it's, you know, penny wise, pound foolish, that old saying, you know, and um, just uh, one question I do have is you, you mentioned it earlier on. So can you just enlighten us a little bit about what the governor wants to do with artificial turf? Is that now somehow deemed not, is it, is it now politically incorrect to have artificial turf? Will we be getting just natural turf? Well, what's going on? The bill that has been um, approved by both the Senate and the Assembly um, would state that synthetic turf is no longer allowed on school campuses, and they are looking at it from a safety component, not from an environmental component. So many school districts installed the synthetic turf because it cut down a lot on your operational costs. Um, and so the bill that is in has a, a lens in regards to safety, um, and there is a recognition that there is no funding to move away from the synthetic turf and go back to a grass and the operational costs impact with that. Yes. Now, mind you, it is sitting on Governor Newsom's desk, so we do not know whether it will be signed or not. Could we all send them a little squatch of artificial grass and say, please don't sign? I'm just remembering a sprained ankles I got on natural turf. 
So I have a couple of questions and um, then we will go out to the um, community. Um, we, you mentioned we have $14,000 in ADA needs, but we haven't completed an ADA study. And having, uh, having uh, been around this campus with um, a, a lens and having had to deal with some ADA needs of students I worked with in the past and knowing students at various campuses, um, that just for some reason, that number seems really low. This was, um, this is pretty much one particular space that they noted that really needed to be upgraded. And I will say this is actually not on one of our least campuses. Um, so yes, you're right. We haven't done an in-depth ADA study. Verde did one. Um, and then we've done, we've done quite a bit to, we've repaved a lot. Um, the bond office has done a lot since that new playgrounds went a long way to remedying some of that. So Yes, you're right. Um, if we wanted to really look at the ADA costs, we would need to dive in deep and have um, another study done for ADA accessibility, which is also an ever moving target because every every 18 months the law changes. And so that makes it just we're always playing catch up. I, I totally understand that. And um, but I just seemed with all of the property that just seemed. not not true not not like no no offense like i don't know how to say that but there's no way we have fourteen thousand dollars in ada needs district wide yeah no you're you're correct on that okay i and i didn't i i didn't want to i didn't know how to say that <laughs> okay um the other questions i i had is just uh something that came to my attention and it's i've actually had two random conversations and I don't know if this is in it's if it's a maintenance issue, if this is a bond issue. Um, we don't have lights at our pools at Santa Clara or Wilcox. And they've had to like stop games in the middle because it's too dark to play. Is can you talk about that? Thanks. Yes. Uh when the pools were constructed, uh lights were never installed. There's lights on the inside of the pools, but not on uh, on the outside of the pools. Um, and so as the board knows, we are currently um, evaluating numerous systems with our pools. Um, they need to be replastered. The boilers at both Santa Clara and Wilcox need to be replaced. That will be about a three to four month project in order to replace the boilers on those. And we are also looking at the lights uh, simultaneously with that, uh, with the eyes of if we're going to have to shut them down and to go get it done, how much can we get done during all of that period of time? Um, and one of the things Michelle and I have looked at is, and uh, we met with a, an outside organization that kind of gave us a little bit of lens because we know that if we put up lighting poles of a certain height, then we need to go through DSA. Um, and one of the outside users who uses pools said it's actually to our benefit for them not to be up because that actually causes an increased glare to the people that are in the pool. And so that is something that we're also looking at as well is what is the appropriate height for those external light poles to be at as well. And so we're looking at all these different types of things. We know that it's an issue and it's one of the things that we're also looking at. Thank you. Um, I would like to um, just, I, I know whenever we talk funding, you know, I, and, and I, you know, we, we wonder how are we going to pay this for all of this? Um, it would be nice to have a, a good, robust plan that looks at our, our own budget. I don't want us to always be dependent on bonds. As I said, I'm surrounded by retired people, and those bonds can be quite costly for, for them. Um, but that, that being said, one of the things that I have appreciated about the city of Sunnyvale is they have a 20-year plan. And what I like with this is seeing the start of a 20 year plan, because that's how you keep your facilities up and you don't suddenly have a facility that's unusable. So you'll you'll notice that that is the four letter word that Michelle and I did not say tonight. And we I appreciated that. I did notice that. Um, the bond is I again I did not say that word. Um, so yes, this is part of that plan is to looking at what resources do we have available and how do we um, budget towards this plan in order to make this work. And it's going to be 
I mean, one it, it it's one point one billion dollars, and we know that thirty percent doesn't have soft costs on there. There's also an asterisk that's on there on I think the second or third page that Agnew, Huerta, and McDonald are not included in here as well. So that's going to be incumbent upon us to do an inventory of all those systems. And we know those HVAC systems are going to have to likely be replaced during the life of this 21 year plan. And so it's on us now to take this same thing and incorporate those three buildings into this component as well. And so the yes, we are going to need to develop a comprehensive funding plan for this as we move forward. Thank you. I just noticed that Trustee Gonzalez's hand is up. So we will have Trustee Gonzalez and then we will go out to the community. Thank you. Thank you for the report, Mark. Um, and uh, as far as uh, I think, is it, I think my, my, uh, my question is semi address as far as this comprehensive uh, funding plan. Um, I know that we uh, have relied and uh, our taxpayers have come forward and really supported our district over the last many, many years with uh, with bond measures. And um, as we look at maybe possible bond measures in the future, maybe hopefully, you know, farther out than, than closer in, but um, it, it would be good that uh, we look at our, and I know, I think uh, Lori Ranieri does a, a projection as far as when our bonds will expire. And um, it would be good to, to uh, for us to see Okay, you know our thirty-year bonds from twenty years ago are expiring on so on such a date, so that we understand. Okay, you know even though maybe uh, our taxpayers might not feel any relief in that, let's say we pass a bond in fifteen years or something, at least they'll understand that you know the, the community is definitely uh, supporting the schools at that time, and uh, they might not see a decrease in their uh, in their um. And the payments that they have for property taxes if, because of bonds, but at least they'll understand that, you know, communities, the community is definitely better for it and uh, that the schools are being provided with, uh, you know, great facilities. So I think, it, you know, part of that, that master plan, it would just be to, to make sure that Lori looks at our bonding capacity and when our, our bonds are uh, paid off so that we understand, you know, what, what, uh, what funding mechanism we might have at that point. But hopefully, you know, I'm talking about long term, not not a not in the maybe five to ten year, maybe like ten to twenty year range or something, further down the road. So I will say that um, Miss Ranieri and I have been looking at our, I'm going to call it our debt management, um, and the and our debt that is outstanding, and when the scale of some of those we within the next several years we have some that are actually going to be falling off of our tax bill. And then I'll also remind the trustees that because some of the things that we've been able to do under Measure BB, we've already been able to shorten the life of our Measure BB bonds, and we haven't even issued all of them yet, and we've been able to shorten the life of uh, that debt as well. And so, yes, we will continue to monitor that, and at some point in time, we'll bring some information back to the trustees about that. Thank you so Thank much. You. Okay, we will now have um, opportunity for the public to comment on the report. Uh, I have no slips. Is there anyone in the room who would like to comment on? Okay, so there's no one in the room. So we'll now go out to the Zoom and um, allow the public to comment from the Zoom. And after that, um, we'll come back to the board and see if there's any final comments. Thank you. Thank you. Public speakers will be called upon in the order that hands were raised. There will be a two minute timer on the screen, similar to the one we have in the boardroom to help you moderate your comments. To ensure everyone has the same amount of speaking time, we will have to move on to the next commenter after two minutes. When your name is called, you will be prompted by Zoom to unmute. unmute excuse me. Our first commenter is Emma Lynn. Hi. Um, first, I just want to say thank you, President Fairchild, for raising um, the concern about accessibility. That is something um, that I also wanted to speak to. Um, as I was concerned that the information presented tonight might be interpreted um, by some as meaning the district does not require significant investment in accessibility improvements. And I think it's important to voice, um, just reiterate, if I'm understanding correctly, the 40K for the follow-up studies are for ADA studies for just 
a few campuses. And having gone through the thousand plus page report, I assume that refers just to Sutter and Curtis campus as those were the only two sites that I noted um, as having meaningful, well, some discussion. I think they just said something about having potential or moderate, potential moderate slash major issues at those two locations. For the other sites um, across the district, the report just repeatedly uses the phrasing, presently it does not appear an accessibility study is needed for this building. And I'm wondering if it's just more accurate to say that accessibility simply wasn't within the scope of the study because it just it's troubling to me that you could just say that it just wasn't needed for so many buildings across um across the district um i think there was a point made in some of the q a about ADA compliance being challenging, and I've spoken before about aiming for inclusion versus just compliance. I would really like to see the district do a district-wide accessibility study with inclusion being the end goal, um, and I hope that the district will conduct a district-wide assessment for accessibility and have a meaningful stakeholder engagement process as part of that. Thank you. Thank you for your comment. We, um, Mr. Shield. I think one of the things is going back to what Ms. Healy said at the very beginning is this is to address what is already in place. So it's to fix ADA accessibility for a, those systems that are currently in place. We acknowledge that there are other things that we need to do as well. In fact, many of our master plans that we brought our master plans that we brought to the board for approval address many of those ADA issues as we move forward, and we are continuing to look at those as well on many of our campuses. Uh, we did a, uh, an accessibility project around Cabrillo and uh, partnered with the city on that. We are looking at a couple other projects on that campus and as well as many others. And so we acknowledge that there are other ADA accessibility projects that need to be done. What was in this report was maintaining and in, in addressing what we currently have in place. Thank you. Well, um, I know that uh, Mr. Adams um, understands how near and dear this is to my heart. And so um, we we want to keep our our schools accessible to all. and i and I know that you guys feel the same. So um, I appreciate efforts in this area. Do we have any other comments from the board? All righty. Thank you so much. Well, it's earlier than I thought it would be. So um, we now go on to item Q1. That is the report from the board. Do we, um, Trustee Ratterman, anything you'd like to say? Just uh, getting ready for the big uh, Party Champions on October 7th. It starts off with the pancake breakfast at uh, the corner of Homestead and uh, Washington, the American Legion Hall, and then there's the village that opens at nine, and then the uh, parade at 11, and then we'll see a lot of you folks in that parade, and then the street dance that I think two or three, maybe Jody can remember the right date, time, and so hopefully we'll see a lot of you there. Thank you. Thank you. Trustee Gonzalez. Just uh, want to mention that AB 2158 passed, and that is uh, an ethics training bill. Um, city Council is already doing an ethics training, and this is just uh, something that board members, school board members would be required to do that as well. And uh, be a two-hour class. I know CSBA is already working on the curriculum, and I think there's going to be uh, some initial uh, classes, I think, on the 29th of November. So uh, moving forward, you'll see, you'll see more uh, support from CSBA as far as that new ethics um, course requirement that uh, board members will have to comply with. Thank you, Trustee Ryan. Um, no updates from me. I'm. Uh, it's uh, it's earlier than some of our meetings, but it's getting later, so I'll go ahead and pass. Trustee Canova. Trustee Lieberman. Um, just a couple things. Uh, I attended the community schools planning meeting um, yesterday. 
Um, and I'm very excited about that process um, starting and moving forward. Um, it's going to be great for our schools, um, for them to um, identify their needs and, and hopefully find solutions for their communities um, over and above what we're already doing. Um, and I'm looking forward to learning more about how we're going to move forward on that. Um, I also attended the elementary literacy group work group meeting on Tuesday. Um, and um, I am excited about that because that's also another urgent thing we need to work on. Um, I wanted to also just um, uh, thank the governor for signing AB5, uh, the Safe and Supportive Schools Act um, that um, protects our uh, our, our LGBTQ plus community and um, requires cultural competency training in all of our schools, um, which is uh, very important, particularly in this climate. Um, um, and finally, I just a uh, self-serving shout out to Wilcox Junior Varsity Water Polo, who will be homestead tonight, eight to five, and my daughter scored a goal. Yay. Thank you. Student Trustee Valdez, would you like to say anything? Thank you so much. Um, I got the opportunity to attend an AEC uh, meeting in regards to the panel that I will be serving on during November 30th to December 2nd. And we were able to formulate with some great questions with Chris Norwood. And on top of that, I was able to attend a networking event with some of my fellow student trustees from across California. And that concludes my report. Thank you. Thank you. Trustee Lee Muirhead. That's awesome that you're getting that opportunity. That's really cool. Um, I visited Pomeroy, uh, Pomeroy Elementary's Garden Day, and um, there were a number of highlights. Um, got to speak with Audrey Hinton, who's doing all the work on the garden out there and um, put all this together. And the highlight was um, talking to the Santa Clara High uh, group, Team React, who's doing work about sustainability at um, Santa Clara High. And then, uh, so I got to meet them in person. And then um, I also had a meeting of the Environmental Literacy and Sustainability Committee that those same students are on. So I've been seeing them on Zoom for the past year and finally got to meet some of them in person. They're really um, shining shining, um, shining lights in our district about um, sustainability on our campuses. And uh, I attended the Math Pathways Committee meeting at Cabrillo. Uh, so the, the team did a great job of presenting the information to parents and the parents had some really good questions that got answered. So um, it seemed like a very positive um, interaction about that project, so that's good to see. I attended the State of the City, uh, Santa Clara State of the City yesterday um, that was held at our very own Wilcox Theater. And um, so it was nice, that partnership that the city was using um, that facility. And um, they did a, a, a really multicultural kind of event. So that was cool to see with some of our students involved in that. Uh, and then finally, yes, the Parade of Champions is coming up October 7th. That's gonna be the place to be on that day. So I hope, you, I hope to see so many of you there, including our own superintendent waving from a car. Thank you, Trustee Muirhead. I think you know I, I will not be there because I have to take my child to a K-pop concert for her birthday. Uh, it was a close, it was a hard decision, very hard decision. Um, this has been a very busy time for, for me, lots of committee meetings. Um, I was very excited last night to go to the SS, the Santa Clara County School Boards Association meeting where there was a fabulous presentation on the science of how to teach kids to read um, done by Greg Jarman from the Los, oh, I think I said his name wrong, but from Los Altos School District. Um, it was it was excellent. Um, there's some of the committees have already been mentioned today. I give a shout out also to Pomeroy for their garden day, which was just delightful and fun, 21 booths. Um, I don't know how you put that together. So uh, with that, can we uh, have a motion, to, motion to adjourn Rotterman and a second? Second. Okay, we get a roll call of this. All right, Trustee Canova. Yes. Trustee Gonzalez. Yes. Uh, Trustee Lieberman. Yes. Trustee Muirhead? Yes. 
Trustee Ratterman. Yes. Trustee Ryan. Yes. I vote yes. Student Trustee Valdez, send us home. Yes. Okay. And the meeting adjourns at 921. Thank you.